Ladies and gentlemen, several, several videos we've done on MythVision highlighting comparisons, attributes, themes, you name it, among other deities and Jesus. We've done it for some time, and of course, there's always a back and forth, and the apologist would love to downplay, ignore, deny sometimes uh, these comparisons that we find that happen to be in the writings of the New Testament portraying Jesus in a certain way. Today I have three. I claim I think they're the most important people in terms of my circle and that I communicate with right now online, and that is these guys. Dr. Richard C. Miller, who's to my left. I've got Gnostic Informant down below, and Derek Bennett. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to make a very important point. Before we proceed, we can't even do this live stream. In fact, we should not and cannot even comment on what will be discussed today before we take our statement of faith. We need to make sure we affirm mm. these particular mm. things about God, Jesus, Scripture, and the church mm. before we have this stream. Um you have to accept these these things. These sign off on these tenets, or you're not going to be allowed to to actually even communicate on these topics. Is that okay with you, gentlemen? And then we can be objective about everything, right? Then, right. Praise it. it. Praise it. Yeah. You you can be objective about everything as long as it doesn't go against these statements of faith. Okay. Makes sense. So these are the found. These are our presuppositions. Okay. We have to start with these. And then we're going to make sure that we come back around and make sure it somehow fits to our statement of faith. Okay. Um, I'm being silly just to open up our stream. There was a recent live stream on my buddy, Michael Jones, inspiring philosophies, YouTube channel, where he just wants to take the task, the skeptic, you know, he wants to let us know, what do you think you're doing, man? Jesus is not comparable. There is no parallels. There is nothing. Jesus is unique like no other deity, and uh, of course, he worships him. <laughs> Along with the guest that joined him, Nathan Nadeau, or Nadeau, I, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his last name, but uh, he's a PhD candidate. Uh, he's a sharp fella, and we do not want to take that away. I put in the description the YouTube video for you to go watch the whole thing yourself over on Inspiring Philosophy so you can see what happened. Pay attention to the live chat, too. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. Um, Dr. Miller, you had something you wanted to say about this and it's kind of sad in one one way but give us some good and bad at the same time here <laughs> yeah well first i think some of the language that's used we we could talk about what a skeptic is but that almost presupposes that there's the dominant kind of proposal and then we're the outsiders kind of poking at it i i think that's kind of almost a wrong-headed kind of way to frame it right up front um we're it's almost more of a, a delineation between reality and people that want to live in a fantasy world. And we have a fantasy kind of world here, kind of a cage that's described in this affirmation. Um, individuals that can't speak outside of that. And so what you're watching when you watch a, a you know, and I, and I, you know, respect the character. I've been in the cage myself. And so I understand what it is. He, you know, the, the guest on the show there cannot go outside of these parameters that are set for him. This is this is basically his employment contract there with a fragile kind of employment arrangement. There's hundreds of people waiting to take his job. And if he steps outside of this cage in any way at all, um, the faith based board of trustees or whatever's uh, governing his employment status there would be quick to act. And so um even if he goes another even another inch or two outside of what's described here. And so you could see there the triumphal resurrection under the the Jesus section there. Yep. That's his required. Sac yeah, it's taken very death, literal. Saves us from our sins, separation from God. Like this is a pretty strict uh statement. And if this isn't, you know, if 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 the evidence, let's just say w we approach it and it, this is no different. This guy we're calling Jesus Christ right here is, I'm not going to say no different. They could take that literal. I'm saying he's another one among several sons of gods, several deified figures who have cultic mythic traditions and, and, and 
practitioners that follow in a line of his mythic uh, topos, so to speak. Um, you know, if this isn't true and you start with this, how, you know, how can you actually get to, to the truth if that isn't the truth? So you have to hold to these uh, kind of creeds, if, if we can call them that, to begin with. But I didn't want to get caught up on that. I just think it was perfect to bring this up when you have someone come who has to sign to work in a certain place, it's hard to imagine that they can objectively critically come to the reality if the reality is not in your bubble. And this is the bubble that they have to live in. D Dr. Richard Miller, you wrote this book, Resurrection and Reception in Early Christianity, a Rutledge Studies and Religion. I hope people will get a copy of. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I swear it's dense, denser than me and Derek Bennett's head combined. Hey, trying to be trying to be honest here okay my wife reminds me and so it is dense and what i mean by dense is i had to pull out the dictionary several times to understand a lot of this stuff but it's it's very scholarly and you really really i don't think you leave anything that you know that you don't touch pertaining to this whole origins of christianity kind of what category we would put this in Go subscribe to Atheological. He's also done a video responding. I put it in the description to this video that we might actually get to review and play some once Dr. Miller leaves. Um, and then you got Gnostic Informant. He just did another video, Becoming a God, Death and Ascension of Numerous Gods. Holy smokes. He even brought some sources we might get into while Rick's still here. We will get into them, even if Rick isn't here. And... Um, this is the video, Pagan Parallels to Jesus with Inspiring Philosophy, that we're actually responding to. Now, to the panel. Rick, I know you wanted to say some things, and we do not want to hog the time while we have you here. Jesus said, you always have the poor with you, but not me. And so I'm looking at you as our Jesus today, my friend. <laughs> Well, so one of the challenges I have even coming into a discussion like this is it, the, the term parallel is just always thrown around as a it's such a soft category and it really doesn't feel like it gets enough. It doesn't put enough real meat on the bones in terms of what we're saying um, in the Hellenistic world. The, the very idea of it, as I've expressed in some of the other vi videos with you guys. The, the very the set the core idea of it is imitation of the Greeks. It's intentional. It's deliberate. Um, these aren't mere parallels. This is an effort to cast someone within a certain type or category. In other words, they're to be interpreted that way linguistically, culturally, etc. So mentally processing someone is very deliberate. And um, what's lost on us today, I think, is the Hellenistic aspects of this take it so much further than what we're used to even in our own culture. You know, uh, in order to rule in the ancient world or to have any kind of cultural capital to be a, a significant figure in the ancient world, you had to register in some way your imitation, your mimetic qualities in relation to these archetypal figures of the classical world. And so we see this in every possible way. You know, I, I, it's hard to imagine any of the rulers not, not falling in line with this in one way or another. I quote on in my book on page 111. Here's a here's from a classicist, John Polini. Here's what he has to say about it. Uh, an important feature of religious belief and political rhetoric in the late Republic and the Principate is the special relationship that individual leaders claim to enjoy with the gods, an idea which served to enhance the leader's position in the state and to validate his acts. In the visual arts, an association with the divine could be expressed most directly through assimilation or imitation of a divinity. Divine assimilation comprises either an alteration of an individual's portrait so that he looks like a god or the presentation of a god with some degree of physiognomic resemblance to a specific individual. In either case, there may be ambiguity as to whether the man is portrayed like a god or a god like a man. And so this is, the, this is a very general pattern that's being observed by classicists across the line. Now, this is not disputed in classics, which is kind of strange. You get over into our field and all of a sudden there's all this confusion. Um, but over there, it's, this, is, this is all well-trodden and accepted uh, observation. And so... 
the archetypal figures, who were they? You've got Heracles, um, you've got Dionysus, Castor and Pollux, you know, maybe in a little bit of secondary class. Romulus, when you're talking about Roman um, propaganda. So, and then Alexander himself, who was, in fact, uh, imitating Heracles in many ways. And so he's kind of, you could see it cascading down, but Alexander became his own archetype because he was such a towering political figure of that time. His, his shadow was cast over the entire Greek East. And so anybody that wanted to rule or have any kind of political capital in the Greek East needed to express their imitatio Alexandri, their imitation of Alexander. And so you see this in coins, you see it all over the place. Mark Antony for in, is, is in Egypt with Cleopatra ruling there. And he's even teased for the extent to which he's imitating Dionysus and Heracles on the daily. He's walking around wearing their clothes. He's, he's got Heracles club. He's, he's, he's wanting, he's, he's trying to do, he's putting it on coins. He's just going, going crazy with it almost overboard. And he ends up becoming teased for it just because he's going so far with it. And that's mostly propaganda coming from Rome, the Roman side, but it, to rule in Egypt, you needed to, sh to you need to, to present your mimetic signals to those around you so that they understand, oh, register this guy as a legitimate ruler in succession to, um, you know, Heracles and Alexander and Dionysus. These were the big cosmocrators, as they say, the ruler, uh, the world rulers. And would it be so safe to say that it would be kind of absurd to say, here's this guy? who's in the Mediterranean world um, and he sees how everyone else is doing. People are seeing this. They see how everyone else is imitating, you know, the, 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 the deities of antiquity, which means these deities go way, 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 way back. Right. Granted, granted, we don't even know if they existed, probably didn't on some of them. Right. Um, and this tends to be this like argument that I was hearing in that live stream, Michael Jones was kind of getting at was like, or Nathan Addo and, and Michael Jones were trying to kind of point out. And it was like, well, Jesus is like a recent figure. And, and these guys, man, they're way, way, way back there. Wouldn't it be like well known that they would have seen what the Caesars were doing? They would have seen what other cultic uh, religious figures were doing and said, Hey, it's, it's like the, the modus operandi to like imitate these ancient antiquity deities and figures so we want to model our jesus off romulus off socrates off whoever from antiquity they want to put the clothes as you did about dionysus on jesus that's what these writings are they're putting a hat and a t-shirt and a sweater and a pair of jeans and a pair of short uh, have an ascension make sure oh make sure that tomb's empty and uh, make sure this and make sure that like isn't that what's yes. going on yeah, there are whole books, and I've got in the third chapter of my book, I've got uh, basically a, a, a depth of research there getting into other scholars, classicists that have whole volumes on each one of these different figures. There's there's a whole book written in German that's on the the political imitation of Heracles and how ubiquitous that was throughout. And, and there's a whole book written on the imitation of Alexander, the, the Roman Alexander, I think it's called by Deborah Steiner. You can go look that up. Fantastic book. And basically it shows that anyone ruling in the Greek East was only legitimate if they, to the extent that they were imitating Alexander. And mm. so that's, they were measured by that. In terms of Rome, you've got, you know, very current at that time, the Caesars during the Principate, wanting to live in, they had actually a house there on, in Rome that was supposedly Romulus's house. And so these guys all wanted to live in the house. They were creating their coins so that they would look like, and so if you go back into Roman art, you'll see them trying to festoon themselves and look like they are Romulian in some way. They're, we've got Augustus even living in the house, dressing like Romulus and claiming that he is the new Romulus. Right. And mm -hmm. so this kind of stuff. And so, you know, and then you've got this this series of emperors that are also having apotheosis and so and and falling in step in some ways with Romulus. And so those two, especially Heracles and especially Romulus, become the archetypal figures 
under which the entire apotheosis and translation tradition falls. And so you could you could go through my catalog there of I don't know, there's 80 or 100 people. Each one can fall either into one or the other or both of those in one way or another, depending on which mimetic signals are being displayed. And so um, those are the two primary figures and, and, and almost everyone can be classified in one way or another as following those templates. I don't want to hog up uh, the time with Rick. So you guys want to highlight something? Cause I have so well, much I could. Uh, speaking yeah. of Augustus trying to be the new Romulus yeah. and, and sort of using that sort of propaganda um, you have with Suetonius, the life of Augustus, you have a, a story about a portent happening. And this, this portent only happened with, with Alexander the Great, and now it's happening with Augustus. And at his funeral, did you hear what happened? There's an ex-praetor, and he swore under oath that he saw the body of Augustus rise up into the heavens. So you have, these are not myths, these are stories that are written, maybe pro in propaganda, but it's not like a, it's, it's, people believe this, this is like supposed to be real. So, I mean, that's, we got, that's right in the sources, you know? So the propaganda is, hey, our guy, I, this is a good question to ask Rick. Uh, you know, we have propaganda today. Uh, humans are pretty much operating the same way that we did 2000 years ago. I imagine the common folk, you want the general populace to think this guy really was, you know, this. Um, the people who were probably in the know, the Senate, the, the educated, the philosophers are probably going, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's legend. It's, it's mythic or whatever. Do you think that, that the general populace would have believed that the Caesar actually did ascend, that this is the propaganda they want the, the known world to kind of be under the stupidity of, Hey, we know what this is. Let them just think, <laughs> This is literally true. We know what this means in our in our category, in our higher echelon of society. Yeah, it becomes difficult. I mean, there there is a cult. There's obviously a ruler cult that's definitely in place, and there's there's sincerity there. That's not a joke. Um, it's also, I think, political propaganda. Uh, uh, Livia, the wife of Augustus, was in large measure even responsible for the. Um, the institution of that cult throughout the major cities in the Greek East. And so they were building these temples left and right, trying to get that stuff going as the, as the early empire was taking off there to really exalt because they hadn't had rulers like this before uh, that had so much power vested in them after Julius Caesar, then every, you know, basic ruler there had unprecedented level of power. And so this was a way to elevate them. In the Greek East, you had to be divine to rule. That was kind of the requirement for the job. And it, so, it, it, yeah. Well, this is a very important point. And then I want to have Derek Bennett jump in here. Uh, we're all well aware that Jesus never spoke of a kingdom. Um, you know, there was no, he never said like the kingdom of God is coming. Um, in fact, he was never even supposedly known in post-mortem situation to have been seated at the right hand of God ruling on high, right? Like, um, so you, you keep talking about these rulers and like these people who would be over kingdoms, but Jesus never talked about kingdoms, right? <laughs> I'm being yeah. sarcastic. I think I think you you know we have to see the the King of Kings. How can he be given dressed up in any less with any less uh, you know uh, magnificence than the Caesars? And let me so, let me throw know. something out there, and I want to get your thoughts on this, Doctor Miller. It, would it be fair to say Christianity, sort of drawing from the same cultural milieu as the Caesar cult would be? but almost in a polemic where they flip it on its head. Instead of having this rich kingdom and having all the power in the world, you're having this like humble Jewish prophet who is going to, instead of like it says in the text, instead of laying up riches in earth, lay up riches in heaven. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like a polemic of what the cult of the, what the Imperial cult is doing sort of flipping it, flipping it basically. Do you think that's fair to say? Yes, it's subversive. And that, you know, that's why these guys are getting killed. It's offensive. They got this backwater, almost like a, an indigent, you know, a vagrant almost walking around without a house or anything. And, you know, they're saying, oh, and by the way, this guy gets exalted just as high as your highest guy.
Right. And that's that's patently offensive. And so that's that's really where the rub is here. And that's why people are getting killed. And, and what's pissing off the, the Roman government is they're taking they're taking this this character that's clearly marginal, clearly not significant in the, in the big theater and the grand theater of classical antiquity and exalting him with the same kind of honors that would go to their highest political figures and even more so. And so, but I would broaden it. It's not just political. You've got philosophers also having translations. You've got uh, generals, you've got athletes even. And so these are, this is the way that you would install someone in the classical antiquities hall of fame, so to speak. These are the protocols is to dress them up with divine birth. You know, one parent is, is a divine parent and the other is human. And then uh, the other one would be to have a stylized ending where they vanish or are translated or ascend. Uh, they're basically given, uh, they're not going to go to Hades, basically. <laughs> they're not going down with everyone else. They're, they're getting installed in the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so to speak. And so, I, we, we have a hero watching us right now. Dennis McDonald uh, just texted me and he says, hey, Jesus almost certainly spoke of the kingdom of God. Why do you think otherwise? And I was like, no, no, no. I was being sarcastic. I think he didn't hear <laughs> well, you, you almost sounded serious for a second. Yeah, I did that on purpose because I wanted to kind of point out like you, you guys keep talking about kingdoms and rulers and like in powers and principalities and stuff. I'm joking. And I'm like, oh, but Jesus never did that. The point I'm trying to say is here's another one. OK, here's another guy who's claiming to get a kingdom that's going to be ruler. And it, it, no, it would be absurd. Right, Dr. Miller, to not think they wouldn't model it or imitate or even react in some way to the well-known what is established here that's over the Jewish people or wh however you want to paint it. Anyway, I've been hogging it, Derek. It's, you got to like interrupt me, man. <laughs> well, I'll jump in here just to say that um, in order to be fair to some of what uh, Jones and Nathan Nadeau were getting at. Um, partly this is a rebuke against the old Frazerian model of the dying and rising God. So what <clears throat> the figures made popular by James Fraser in the Golden Bough, the, the sort of uh, uh, dying and rising crop deities, um, most scholars today, and certainly not Richard Miller here, would say, you know, most scholars would not say that Jesus was just another dying and rising crop deity like Adonis or Tammuz. Mm -hmm. um, so they're right about that. Uh, but what we're talking about is something a little bit different, if not loosely related, but a little different. And I think I think Dr. Miller would agree with this is, is more of the uh, apotheosis and translation and, and Greek resurrection beliefs that were popular during the time that that christianity emerged uh, dr miller was it was in fact the one who helped me to kind of parse those two uh so that's that's why after i wrote my chapter on dying and rising gods and in, in john loftus's anthology uh when i went and i did my presentation for the global center for religious research on resurrection and apotheosis i've done that for uh for your channel Derek, I was sure to to separate those two categories. And so it's more the apotheosis and translation uh, type of mythos that we're really getting at here. The problem, as I see it, is that sometimes the lines between those two categories can get a little bit blurred because there was so much cross pollinization and syncretism in the ancient Mediterranean world. So, for instance, uh, Osiris, I bring that one up all the time. You know, he, he falls into that sort of that Frazerian category of the dying, rising God. But that is equally an apotheosis myth uh, for Osiris and for ancient Egyptians. What happened to them? They became immortal and everlasting gods. There, there are even depictions of uh, of the Pharaoh ascending into heaven as Osiris had done. And um, great work by Eliezer Gonzalez. He traces even some of these Greco-Roman asset motifs to ancient Egyptian thought. Uh, not to say that it came exclusively from that, but that there is something of a link there. So uh, I bring up in my video, uh, what the, the response that I did to Jones and Nadeau, I bring up the example of Antinous, the lover of Hadrian. And so this is a figure from the uh, Greco-Roman world, second century, I believe. And he is clothed like Osiris. 
uh, to say that he is he he becomes known as Osirantinus, the reborn and everlasting. On the obelisk, it says that he was raised again to new life. He becomes an immortal god, uh, and others can be initiated into the cult of Ananus uh, so that they can become immortalized figures like him. Uh, so this this kind of phenomenon, <laughs> this deification, can happen to actual historical figures and that's kind of the salient point here and that's what we're saying it looks like that's what happened with jesus so it doesn't matter that he was yes he was probably a, an actual historical figure but he became deified according to common cultural conceptions and mythic motifs of the time yeah it's correct i i think uh there's kind of an interesting analogy it would be like um I mean, what what they did with this it should should end the discussion, really. Where did this go? Where did this story go? If it literally happened that Jesus rose from the dead, say, let's just presuppose that as the let's put that as the hypothesis. This all really happened. And somehow by some freak of nature or something ended up looking a lot like what we see in all of these um, myths. Right. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a more sophisticated argument that was put forward. Maybe he, he rose in some fine, funny kernel of a fashion and then is maybe dressed up in literature. Otherwise, you kind of wonder why would they even do that if they really thought this happened? That would have rocked their minds and they would have written it correctly and, and would have distinguished it. They would have worked all day to distinguish it, which is not what we see. Um, but had, had, let's just suppose that's what's going on. Then, you know, it's a little bit like... Uh, you know, you've got someone we came, went into this discussion the other day about the guy who cut you, you, you see some story about some guy that comes out of a phone booth and then flies into the air to fight crime. <laughs> and uh, but no, this really happened. I really saw this. It was on Fifth Avenue and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There'd be a, a tremendous amount of work to try and make sure that everyone knows this isn't crazy talk. This really took place. And um, you wouldn't go and then publish a comic book that's 40 pages long with cartoons of this guy coming out of the phone booth and then sell it in a comic book store, right? And have different that's, kinds that's, of comics <laughs> that don't agree with each other that tell different stories about yeah, the you, guy. You, and... But that's exactly what we see with the early Jesus cult. It's set up alongside of the other cults in the major cultic, you know, basic marketplace of ideas in the major urban centers in Corinth and Ephesus. These places are the places where you'd get something like that off the ground. You couldn't yeah. do it in rural areas. You'd have to take it to these cultural hubs. And, and it's set up as almost just another franchise alongside of all of these other offerings. And it's starting a religion. It's not starting a, we're talking about a scientific reality story. We're starting a cult with people singing songs and giving offerings and doing all the same patterns that we would expect in other cults. And so it's patterned after that across the board, pretty much. And so it just because it, the argument doesn't just achieve absurdity, it surpasses it, really. Wow. I mean, look, no, look no farther than uh, Justin Martyr and his apology where he's. Hey, why are you guys criticizing me? Are you, you you have sons of God. You have Mercury. You call him the Logos. Dude, this intro, Neil, in this book, it literally starts with that. And funny hey, thing so, is, yeah. he didn't discover this till later uh, as he was really diving in. And he found the fathers agree with everything he's just saying. What what I love what you just did, Rick, is you took, you took a model that we know as Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, whatever – comes out of the phone booth, boom, he's flying in the sky, whether it's a web, whether it's his cape, he has abilities from another planet, you name it. Um, we know this is fiction. We know this kind of fiction model. But then you, we're now supposed to assume this guy is not clothed in fiction. He's not wrapped as the other supermodels or superheroes in the whole nine. Uh, but you went even a step further than just kind of using that little example by showing the same cultic practices we have, you know, uh, John um, Kloppenborg's, you know, Christ Associations book that goes in and analyzes. They used similar language. Ecclesia is not a Christian term. It is a well-known Greek term. They are setting up temples, house worship. The, their cultic worship practice is modeled after the same thing. You talk about Paul Sanius, uh, or I think I'm saying it right. 
and he walks through Corinth and he's going, look at this, look at that, look at this, all the cultic mythic stuff. And these other cultic mythic heroes also wore capes like Jesus, also flew out of the thing. And, and guess what? Some of them didn't wear a cape. Some of them just disappeared. They didn't fly. Or some of them burned on a pyre instead of dying on a cross. Or, or some of them might have cut their testicles off and bled to death instead of yada, yada, yada. Oh, but Jesus is unique. And this is so interesting because if we use their argument— so is Hercules, so is Osiris, so is Julius Caesar, so is Octavian, so is Romulus, so is Alexander the Great, so are all of them. Venus, Mars, you name it, they're all unique. They mm -hmm. all do different things. They all have different attributes. Therefore, they're all true. That's That would be absurd if you heard me trying to make cases to argue for these deities in that respect. It yeah. just eventually became the success, successful cult. Exactly. When we see we see intentionality to it, and even trying to feign translation, you know, Empedocles, for instance, the ancient philosopher, tried to throw himself into the volcano on Mount Etna, out in the Mediterranean, and in order so they wouldn't recover his body, so that he could be also recorded as having been translated, so that his remains wouldn't be found. And so we that have Alexander the Great. <laughs> Alexander the Great at the when he saw his life coming to an end, you know, with the, you know, he gets sick and all that, wanted to throw himself into the Euphrates, according to our sources, so that they wouldn't be able to recover his body, so that they would be able to worship him afterwards. And so, you know, these are this was in a whole war over his body after between right, Ptolemy and right. yeah. Proteus Peregrinus is on at, at the Olympic Games in 165. Uh, CE, and he's going to throw himself into a funeral. Uh, I mean, a, 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 a pyre, a, um, a a big bonfire, basically, and die like Heracles. Again, intentionally, the idea there is they wouldn't be able to recover his bones, and his disciples are standing by, you know, mm. to make sure that this that this all comes off right. It's a great account in Lucian if you get a chance to read it. And wow. then they they see him ascend, and they and the, and supposedly some voice that he's going up, flying up to Olympus. And then uh, a day or two later, someone comes back to the funeral service, the panegyric that they had there to commemorate this individual and declares that they had seen him back in Athens in the portico of the seven voices walking with a gleaming white toga on or whatever and a garland of white uh, of, of olive on his head and had this encounter with him. And this is a postmortem appearance. And so. <laughs> There's a lot of intentionality going on here. People are trying to get them get get these get their stories into that form intentionally, so that they can uh, then receive this exalted knocklement to use the the German word there afterlife or kind of legacy. They want to be remembered as above, you know, beyond human, as like superstars. So you have two things that I think are really interesting about your book, Rick. Again, I got a self plug here. I got like 15 more recordings with you in 4K, by the way, on the Patreon and on the YouTube member thing. If you like hearing what Rick's saying, help support us. I've I like I traveled, I paid out of my own pocket, I made a trip to California, I recorded all this, I edited all this. It's a lot of work. So when people talk about three dollars a month is too much, too bad. I mean, Starbucks isn't handing out free coffee. We kind of live in a world where things cost money. So I worked my butt off. $3, I think that's a heck of a deal for the whole month. You can drop the Patreon after after one month and milk me just to get those videos. So um, I wanted to read something I think is interesting, but first comment about your book. That is this missing body thing that we find about the empty tombs. I tend to think it's legendary narrative, right? It, it has a narrative structure. It's got, it, it just has a punch about it. And Matthew really highlights that like the stone's not even moved and Jesus is yet in, like the angel moves it to show you he's not in there, but he's not in there. So like, this is evidence of him being a God. Um, Kalihari, I pronounce it Kalihari. How do you pronounce it? Is it Kalarho? Gallery hallway, yeah, something like Hilar this. I, I was like looking online how to pronounce this. I want to read from book three or section three uh, of book three. Uh, the tomb robbers, 
had been careless in closing the tomb. It was at night, and they were in a hurry. At the crack of dawn, Charias turned up at the tomb, ostensibly to offer wreaths and libations, but in fact, with the intention of doing away with himself, he could not bear to be separated from Kalihari and thought that death was the only thing that would cure his grief. When he reached the tomb, he found that the stones had been moved and the entrance was opened. By the way, this was probably written mid-first century A.D., all right, so the, the, the stone moved and the entrance was open. He was astonished at the sight and overcome by fearful perplexity. Sound familiar? At what had happened. Rumor, a swift messenger, told the Syracusians this amazing news. They all quickly crowded around the tomb, but no one dared go inside until Hermocrates gave an order to do so. The man who was sent in reported the whole situation accurately. It seemed incredible that even the corpse was not lying there. Then Chereus himself determined to go in, in his desire to see Kalihari again, even dead. But though he hunted through the tomb, he, found, he could find nothing. Many people could not believe it and went in after him. They were all seized by helplessness. One of those standing there said, the funeral offerings have been carried off. It is tomb robbers who have done that. But what about the corpse? Where is it? Because, you know, tomb robbers wouldn't have taken the corpse, according to this. Many different suggestions circulated in the crowd. Just like the gospel say the disciples stole the body. Chereas looked towards the heavens, stretched up his arms and cried, Which of the gods is it? Then, who has become my rival in love and carried off Kalihari and is now keeping her with him against her will, constrained by a more powerful destiny. That is why she died suddenly, so that she would not realize what was happening. That is how Dionysus took Ariadne and Thesus, how Zeus took Semele, oh, sorry, from Thesus, how Zeus took Semele. It looks as if I had a goddess for a wife without knowing it someone above my station, but she should not have left the world so quickly, even for such a reason. Thetis was a goddess, but she stayed with Peleus, and he had a son by her. I have been abandoned at the very height of my love. What is to happen to me? What is to become of, of me? Poor wretch. Should I do away with myself? And who would share my grave? I did have this much to look forward to in my misfortune that if I could not continue to share Kalihari's bed, I should come to share her grave. My lady, I offer my justification for living. You force me to live because I shall look for you on land and sea and in the very sky if I can reach there. This I beg you, my dear, do not flee from me. At this, the crowd broke out in lamentation. Everyone began to lament for Kalihari as though she had just died powerful first century ad novel talking about an empty tomb experience fear and trembling the deification of her being missing is evidence that she was taken by the gods to become a god because she was really a goddess i meant um there's so many things i highlight in that and i'm thinking i'm not saying that the gospels borrowed this shoot they don't even have to know about each other i'm saying as you're saying rick there's a game there's a certain kind of literary structure that you would want to model your figure after. Yeah, it's it's a uh, this is how you would signal in terms of linguistics, in terms of cultural kind of uh, pattern. This is how you would signal that this is what that meant, what that signaled. Uh, the body's gone, deified. That would have been the, that immediate connection was was just implicit there. And so notice there wasn't a lot of even justification for that there. They didn't go and do any work to try and draw any line why that would be the case. It's because that would have been the clear way that that would have registered in the, in the ancient psyche and mind. And so, you know, I think that you could see over my, and, and this is one of the things that if you see this, this pattern over this, over a spread of nearly a thousand years, some of the examples that I give there is well entrenched, you know? And so, um, that's, it's kind of the unavoidable sort of, uh, implication of that. And so this is how you would, this is how you would speak to that. And now the gospels have to work overtime to try and present that because they're using the word resurrection. 
And so, but they need to, so in the epilogical content that you get at the end of each one of those narratives, there's a, a lot of work to be done to make sure that those signals are, are present and clearly registering for the reader. So that there's no mistaken interpretation over what they mean. And so Jesus is able to, you know, be touched and grabbed and all of this, but at the same time, he can walk through walls. He can eat broiled fish, but at the same time, he could disfigure himself such that he's not even recognizable. Um, so his physicality there is important because that's also, it just distinguishes him from being a ghost. And in fact, in one of the episodes, I think it's in, was it Luke at the end there? He, he in fact, try, is explicit. I'm not a ghost, you know, right. <laughs> he's trying yeah. to make sure you understand that and in no uncertain terms. But at the same time, he's got all of these um you know, uh, theistic properties is these godlike properties. Um, and so he, it, which, which are their way of saying, look, he's not, he's not what he was before this, these able to do things. Now it's fuzzier than that because this isn't, I mean, the, the theologian will go back and read that and think there's some hard category there. It's a little bit like Gandalf going from what was it? Gandalf the gray to Gandalf the white or something in the, you know, he, he, you know, it's next level. Right. A little bit like that going on, but it's not this hard, like ontological theological category that you'd get in like a systematic theology or something like that. Because you've got the, you know, the transfiguration on the mountain. It's kind of a preview of it, right? Right. He basically gets up there and then you get the, the divine voice that, you know, they're getting ready to set up the three shrines, right? What was it to Elijah and uh, uh, Moses. Moses? Yeah. And, uh, and then they were going to give one to Jesus also. And then the divine voice comes and says, no, 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 no. He's not like them. They, yeah, they did raise, they did ascend also. But this is, this is a demigod. This is my beloved son. You know, distinguish him. And so they were going to set up three cenotaphs up there, three little shrines, right? That's kind of what the, te the, the segment indicates. And so anyway, so that's the idea is that he's exalted. He's being exalted in the text. This was the protocol this is the only way I think they could have gotten this off the ground in any kind of trajectory that moved into the Rome, the, the Mediterranean world. What's interesting is if you look at trajectories of earliest Christianity that moved in other directions, like say down into Africa or like to the East into Parthia or something like that, they don't do this kind of work the same way or at all, even like Manichaeanism isn't, they're not interested in dressing. Jesus, Jesus doesn't have these properties. And, and you see that even surviving in some ways into early uh, Islamic tradition, the Jesus that's there isn't dressed up like, you know, in, in these uh, cultic forms that you would see prev prevalent in the Mediterranean world. He's, he's a prophet more in that context. If you go down into like uh, Gnostic tradition, they're, they're struggling. They've got their own kind of way of painting him. You know, it's not, they, they want him to shed his body kind of in a platonic way. So, and so you get to see that in some of the, like Marcy and I, and some of the other Gnostic traditions where they're trying to get rid of the body because they would see that as a negative thing that he would have physicality afterwards. Cause that's, that's a bad philosophical idea. And so anyway, mm. So he's it's adapting. And so you see the mythic, the myth, the mythic dress that's going in the Orthodox tradition or the so-called Orthodox tradition is highly Hellenistic and highly Romanistic and moving that direction full speed. And so and you see all that evidence in, as early as even in the, the gospel tradition. So. Don't want to step on anybody's toes. Did you guys have something you really dearly want to get off your chest? Um, you okay. might, while we've still got Richard with us, take a bite out of the other thing Nato tried to propose was that unlike a lot of these other figures, um, <clears throat> with the gospel accounts, the, these are, uh, these are historical accounts. These are biographies. Um, and then he even allows for, you know, even, even if you want to say that it's historical fiction, it's still historical in nature. And that is so unlike these other figures. Uh, so I'm just curious if Dr. Miller would like to comment on that. Yeah, I'm not sure that last nuance that you made there historical like um, maybe that's kind of a puzzler. But I mean, we have to understand what, what even is a legend? And that's the whole idea of it, right? Is that you're kind of fusing history with some tall tale down in it, right? It's uh, it's 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 history like in some way. We tell stories about different characters, uh, Davy Crockett, you know, 
uh, <laughs> St. Patrick, whatever. And these are untethered from history. There, there is a historical kernel there somewhere, um, possibly. Even Santa Claus, you know, uh, there was, I guess, a dude. <laughs> he's, 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 he's all but lost to us, uh, St. Nicholas. But um, so it's untethered in that way. Uh, but yeah, I would say that you've got this going on at Christianity is not the only, or the, the Christian kind of depictions of Jesus is not the only place you find this. Um, even if you want to go to the life of Apollonius, you know, Philostratus's work there, you've got a, you know, another sage that's going and doing a lot of miracles and other kind of works. He's got philosophical and rhetorical, you know, wit and capability there that's above the standard human ca capability. And, and at the end of his career, he ascends, you know, he, he, is, he ascends to heaven. And so um, that's that's one. You could go even Pythagoras is another interesting one in the cult of Pythagoras and what's going on there. Now, those are later in some ways, but they are, I think, having to work with they're downstream from the Christian tradition in some ways, interpreting it. Lucian's work with per Proteus Peregrinus, you know, Proteus, the guy that threw himself on that fire in 165, it said that. According to Lucian, that guy had been a Christian and not just a Christian, the teacher of the Christians and not just the teacher of the Christians. He had been like the second Christ in that community and a writer wow. and all sorts of things. He was a major figure <laughs> and uh, had decided to fall in. And, and, and Lucian paints him as a charlatan, a huckster, some guy that's, you know, running around duping everyone. And so um, and then he decides to deconvert, so to speak, and take up this kind of cynic or stoic kind of way. And that's when he kills himself. But it's in also kind of imitation of the way he under interpreted what was going on with Jesus. And so is it kind of a stunt man in some ways? Dude, and there's so many good things you just said, Rick. I want to highlight a comment that was on Derek Bennett's uh, YouTube video. I just commented this earlier, by the way. We'll, we'll get into more of this stuff. But while we have you, Rick, I wanted to just highlight Camille Greger's comment because I thought it was really good because you brought up this whole, if we thought this was history, it'd be a bit absurd. The two leading explanations of the evidence offered by Christian apologists other than a mass, other than a massive coincidence are Yahweh made Jesus's life similar to other ancient Mediterranean figures to make Christianity more plausible. Satan made myths about other ancient Mediterranean more similar to future Jesus's life to make Christianity less plausible. Uh, I think we should appreciate that if the two leading explanations of the same evidence involve literally the maximally good being and literally the maximally evil being, and there is apparently no way to tell which one is true, Christianity might have some serious issues with explanatory power in the first place. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm a fan. Gregor, good job, man. Yeah. Well, you know, what I would what I would say to that, to, to Camille there, is that there's really no escaping the problem of massive coincidence. You know, he tries to offer those in, in a, you know, in a uh, uh, sort of sardonic way, tries to offer those as alternatives, you know, that a theologian might offer. But even if you want to try and put this up to God or to Satan, it's still awfully coincidental that either of those superpowers should do it right there in the very space time, the very cultural and historical milieu in which these ideas were prominent. There's really no escaping it. It's, it's, it's a problem. That's Rick. You can speak on it, man. That's why you were saying Justin had to deal with it. Neil's done videos on this. Oh, I've done videos. You've talked about I, this. I just recently in my second last video, I, I, I mentioned, and I, I don't. I was recording this. This wasn't part of my like script or anything. I just went off the cuff, and I said, "People like inspiring philosophy can just pretend it doesn't exist because it's not part of the culture anymore, as much as it was." Justin Martyr had no choice. He had to deal with it. He had to write about it. It's right in front of him. He walks outside. There's a temple of Hercules. He walks over there. There's a temple. Of <laughs> he can't ignore it. So you now, have to, Nate, everyone should read that passage, by the way. It's just a now, what, what Michael would say to that, and I'm interested in, in getting uh, Richard's take on this as well, is, is well, you see, you see um, Justin Martyr was fighting for his life, fighting against persecution. And so he had to stretch and exaggerate 
these comparisons in order to save his own hide and that of other Christians. Um, curious what you have to say to that, Dr. Miller. I, it's 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 kind of feels a little bit like Camille's kind of argument where it's both sides. You've got Justin Martyr. Don't forget what he's called. <laughs> he, he's, that's where he's taken this. Good point. Um, so he's not afraid to die. He's not afraid to tell the truth. He's not afraid to get right down to it there. And so uh, the, it, I think it is in some ways just to disrespect. It, it's interesting that the the Christian argument is to disrespect the earliest Christian argument. And oh, so, wow. <laughs> I love that. So, so your crazy. point is, and just to highlight, I want to get into the nit nitty gritty here. He died for a reason, not because he screamed and kicked and tried to get out of the pickle by making up anything he could. He died because he stood his ground it, where he stood his ground by comparing Jesus, but still emphasizing, hey, those others are done by demons. Ours is the true, you know, path that you should follow the way. Um, and then you've highlighted Ignatius with me, mm -hmm. and we read the letter to Rome. Oh, my gosh. This guy was the most suicidal-sounding church father I've ever heard anyone write. Mm -hmm. This guy was begging the Roman church to make the animals, the beasts that are going to eat him, his tomb. He begged them to let him die. His fourth ch uh, chapter in that, I think, or fifth, says, I want to die. That's the title. And then he goes on, brethren, please do not keep me from the death that awaits me to become one with my Christ. And like, dude, these guys wanted to die. So this it's, it's the biggest throw the early Christians under the bus as much as we can to save our modern apologetic as we can. And I think the most, the least ad hoc is exactly what Neil just said, exactly what you're bringing up, Derek, and what Richard writes about in his book. That is, you can't get away from it. He had to engage this. He had to show, look, yes, you know, Jesus looks similar to Ariadne and the Zeus's and the, or Zeus and the sons of Zeus, um, you know, the Caesars, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes yeah. on. Let me, let me issue this challenge to the reader. You get this oftentimes that I, I've even seen it in a lot of these comment threads and it's a well-intended argument, but it's, it's just a false, it's patently false. The early Christians were dying because they they had this compel they were compelled to because of this historiological case around Jesus raising from the dead. So they're they're going to their deaths like lambs to the slaughter, repeating that they the five hundred saw him and creating you know creating this case that that Jesus I I cannot but be here because I know that he rose historically or whatever. Show me that text. Show me one of those martyrdom tales where that's exactly the way the the psychology of the person. Yeah, I'd like to see that. And yeah, so I was talking to um, I was talking to someone about this just recently. And a lot of these narratives show up a long time later. They're kind of legendary, if it's if I'm not mistaken. Right, right. And it's and in fun. It's kind of a little bit. And Canada Moss has brought this out in her book. It's a little bit like the Old West. You know, more people died in 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 shoot 'em ups on Hollywood screen sets than in the actual boring Old West. And so if you go back into antiquity, I think I think we're blowing up the, the early propagandistic aspects of martyrdom and why they were producing these texts to scandalize the, the, the tyrants that were they were they were, you know, and the powers that be at that time. Um, you know, there are more people dying in the text than are actually dying in reality. And so you didn't want to. That's part of asceticism. You didn't go hide in a cave somewhere and you didn't want anyone to know. They got to know you're over there, or else it's not working. You know, <laughs> they got to know. They got to know that you're over there, and they also need to know that you're not eating and stuff like that. It was it, there was a there was a political side to this. The same thing with martyrdom. It, you wanted to die in front of Caesar as a spectacle, not out in some in the woods somewhere with no one seeing it. And so, the the idea was that you know that I, if you go back into those texts. They didn't want to die for Jesus. They wanted to die like Jesus. And there's a, a major significance there, a significant shift there that goes all the way back to the Gospels themselves. You know, if you want to follow me, you got to take up your cross, too. Um, and so you're, you're dying, too. This is a martyrdom cult in some ways. And, you know, right. what did John the Baptist die for? Wow. You know? And so Dr. He, Miller. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep talking. <laughs> I think if you go across the Luke Acts, there's no death for sins theology there. You, you know, search it. Oh, yeah. 
That's not the signification that's given to Jesus' death in Luke Acts. It rather you get a compendium of martyrological tales with Jesus merely figuring prominently in that. Wow. Yeah. And so each one of those meant to scandalize. And so there, there's a different reason why they're dying. It's not, it's not what's normally presented as, well, they're dying because of the case that modern apologists are, are trying to prop up. Uh, that's not that's that's a falsehood that's being projected back onto it. You could say, in a way, being it's martyrological, they're dying. This is a philosophy to them. This is their philosophy, the same way other philosophers died for their their philosophical, cultic, mythic trope or whatever. Yeah, martyrdom was the supreme manifestation of ascasis. That is your kind of your contempt for the world, your your severe self treatment. And so this was the, the, like the supreme manifestation of your philosophical sophistication, the idea of being able to face death uh, without flinching. Uh, that was a huge statement in the ancient world. And it, that's part of why Christianity won out with some of the spectacle of that. But a lot of it's going on in the work that the, lit the literature is doing as kind of an agency in that culture. And so there's propaganda there about it. And so, and it goes all the way back. You go back to the Maccabean martyrs and two and four Maccabees, what were they dying for exactly? Um, again, it's spectacle against Antiochus. And so, hmm. Judas. Derek, what, what were you going to say, D? Oh, just for the sake of clarification on Martyr, I, on Justin Martyr, um, he, he, the apologists have it half right in that he is, he is making an argument um, in the face of persecution. Um, but he's he is not exactly having to stretch <laughs> in order to make these comparisons. And I mean, what are the chances he is going to convince pagans of certain parallels that they would know better <laughs> are fabricated or exaggerated? That makes no sense. I think it's true, Derek. I'm going to drop off and let you guys carry on after this, <laughs> but I'll make this point that it wasn't just a mic problem with uh, Justin Martyr. And as I said in another video with Derek, that same argument continues on beyond Justin. And you see it recurring throughout the early apologists. Arnobius, even two full centuries later, is making the same argument and then some. Eusebius. Right. Eusebius is doing it big time. Right. And so it's not just one guy who's afraid over in the corner. Good point. You know, it's this is this is the this is the only track that they could have taken with it that would have flown. No yeah. other argument would have worked in that context because everyone would have called it out as bullshit. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Rick. Look, everybody, go get a copy of Dr. Richard C. Miller's book, Resurrection and Reception in Early Christianity. If you want to watch more of what Rick has to say, I've got like 15 more recordings all on the Patreon all on the YouTube membership side. So you can go check that out, go to the community tab and see all those. They're there. This book is amazing. Rick, I, final words from you, brother. No, oh, I just thank you. All. I'm a fan of all three of you guys. You guys are the best. Same. So I, I, I'm privileged to know you guys. Hey, okay, don't listen. forget to remember your, your, your statement of faith. Okay. Everywhere you go. Uh, okay. <laughs> right. I'm going to reaffirm that right after we get off the call here. <laughs> exactly. You guys. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Thanks for joining us, Rick. All right, I dropped him off here. We're gonna go like this here. Um, this this was. I'm gonna go down here and let you guys uh, hang out on top of me here. We got a couple of super chats, mm -hmm. but there's so mm -hmm. much, guys. Um, there's so much we get to talk about and can go over now. Uh, now that Rick is, uh, you know, painted a way for us to kind of go down a path here. Uh, I'm gonna wait on the super chats. We'll get to you. Thank you for the support. But what are your comments? I mean, I was, I was, I was going through the Justin Martyr passage just now, and I realized he's doing better comparative mythology than we are. Like he's he's dropping Perseus being born of a virgin. He's dropping son, sons of Jupiter getting getting suffering for the sins of people. Like he's going past what I'm doing, Justin mm -hmm. Martyr. I mean, I, I think we should probably pull uh, you want a little super chats, but I think we should pull that text up again. Sure. And then I can I have some other sources too we can go through too. Share your screen. All right. I don't know if we want to do super chats first or not. So, well, would, yeah, let's bust them out here. Okay. 
MH, thank you the, for the super chat. Yahweh equals storm god who destroys chaos beast, lost his coherence through time as humans vied for claim to Yahweh's inheritance for L. Original Yahweh is much more interesting. I agree. I tend to love the idea of like the the, the primitive, uh, you know, very anthropomorphized uh, human with a penis and a wife and he's mad and he's angry and he's happy and he's sad and he's having babies and all that kind of stuff. I like that God uh, better than I do this whole outside space and time because our modern philosophy tells us that God cannot uh, potentially be, you know, like I'd much rather have that archaic beast of a deity not like to actually literally worship just to study because <laughs> it's actually a reflection of the people more often than not i love how these more philosophically uh inclined christian apologists are trying to graft that sophisticated you know um uh philosophy of religion you know what i mean type arguments for god onto this archaic tribal storm god from way back when i love watching them do this it tickles me pink <laughs> thank you mh ginger griffin how did ancients view a work like the aeneid they knew virgil wrote it and that he was imitating homer but did they somehow imagine it to be a true account of rome's founding that's above my pay grade on answering. That's actually... How did ancients view a work like the Aeneid? They knew Virgil wrote it, and he was... this. One for Dr. McDonald. But did they it somehow is. imagine it to be a true account of Rome's founding? I, I don't know. That's a good question. We're going to call the king McDonald here. Ah. <laughs> Hey, Derek. Hey, Dennis. We have a, a, you know, who wants to be a millionaire? I'm on a question that if I don't get right, uh, you know, they gave me a phone a friend option. So I decided I'd phone you. We are live. And the question is, how did ancients view a work like the Aeneid? They knew Virgil wrote it and that he was imitating Homer. But did they somehow imagine it to be a true account of Rome's founding? Um, no, I don't think the issue is true in the historical sense, but it's important to know that Virgil was a historian of sorts right. and that people who read uh, the Aeneid teased out some of those uh, allusions to history. But uh, they knew it was a founding mythology and it was a creation of um, a narrative to evoke the, uh, the literature of classical Greece. Yeah, but it has historical information there. And uh, uh, I suppose readers were sophisticated enough to be able to um, parse that out. Now, some probably thought the Aeneid was historical to some extent, but I really don't think that's helpful. I think most were um, aware of the, the fictional nature of it and were not at all uh, displeased with the foundation mythology that Virgil had created. Thank you, Dennis. I think I might win this game. I really appreciate you, brother. Let me add something to that when, you, when you're done with them. All right. Thank you, Dennis. I'm going to let you go, brother. You too. Bye. So I also think this too. When you like, so Plutarch, I know this is, this is a century later, but Plutarch does his parallel lives and Plutarch takes real historical people. For example, he compares Caesar to, Ju to Alexander the Great. He compares Theseus to, well, the, not in this case, Romulus and Theseus he compares to the gods there. But he compares like Pericles and Fabius Maximus. He compares, uh, the one I love the most, Mark Antony and Demetrius. That's a good one to read. So Cicero and Demosthenes, two great orators in their respective senates, the Athens and Rome. He's comparing these two, these people from different periods of time. And he's writing these stories about them and like seeing how they line up. You can almost argue that something like the Aeneid is someone like Virgil is taking the mythical stories of the past and comparing them to what's happening in the, in the time period that he's in and then rewriting it. And then boom, in the same way that Plutarch does his lives, you have Virgil rewriting Homer for the, for, for a Latin audience. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it, it, that's the game, right? That's the game in town. That's why I asked that curious question of like, did people really believe some of these mythical, legendary, you know, oh, well, the Caesar really did become a god. And, and it's it's not a black and white thing, but I imagine some did, but some probably didn't. And, and I'm not just talking about the higher echelon. There's right. probably just people who knew that, hey, this is what you do with your figure. Right. Um, I want to say thank you to the governor for becoming a member. I really appreciate that. I just found out YouTube allows you to gift memberships. Remember that, Neil? I owe you a stream, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and last one says, Michael Apple says, fine, keep putting Miller on. See if I care. <laughs> I you. hate I hate that Michael Apple. I hate that guy. I tell you, he's a good looking <laughs> Apple, though. Look at him. Look at him over there. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate that. We are done with Super Chat, so now we can get into some sources. All right, and gonna, feel wanna, free to super chat. I'll get to him here in a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to start with this, with with what with, with Justin Martyr's laying down. All this right. Is so this is so big. Like this is like the end. This ends the conversation. This is a conversation ender for like, is there like the parallel, whatever you want to call it? Because even if we have Justin Martyr in the second century seeing it and writing it down, then it's like, what else was there to talk about? So he says, like in the Sybil, in the Hysispus has said that there should be a dissolution by God, things corruptible. And the philosophers called the Stoics, they even teach that God himself should be resolved into the fire. And they say that the world is to be formed anew by this revolution. But we understand that God, the creator of all things, is superior to the things that are being changed. If therefore on some points we teach that same things are as the poets and philosophers whom you honor, and on other points are fuller and more divine in our teaching, and if we alone afford proof of what we assert, why are we unjustly hated more than all others? So he's like, he, you know, he's talking about like, we shall seem to utter the doctrine of Plato while others. And while we say that there will be a burning up of all, we shall seem to utter the doctrine of the Stoics. And while we affirm that the souls of the wicked, this is from Plato's Republic, being endowed with sensation, even after death are punished and that those of the good being delivered from punishment spend a blessed existence. So this is so important because like Justin Martyr is pointing out that like you got, we all love Plato. Plato's the greatest, but even he has these disagreements with some of the poets. And even he thinks that stuff that we believe is what is, is true. Like mm -hmm. we're like, we're lining up with Plato. And so why are we getting called out? And then it gets even crazier. Cause then he says, well, we talk about this logos, the word the capital word, who is the first birth of God was produced without a sexual union that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher was crucified, died and rose again. And ascended. And ascended. Yeah. About nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you assume sons of Jupiter. For, you know, how many sons you esteem writers ascribe to Jupiter, Mercury, the interpreting logos word, and teacher of all. And that's that's a fact. Mercury was the logo. See, that's not even just in that's even in down in Egypt and the hermetic stuff. Asclepius, who though though he was a great physician, was struck by a thunderbolt and ascended to heaven. And Bacchus, too, after he'd been torn limb from limb, and Hercules, when he committed himself to the flames to escape his toils, the sons of Leda and the Dioscori, and Perseus, son of Danae. So he gets into all this stuff, right? And we can, you guys can all read this for yourself. But like he, he even goes when you go down to here, he's even go. He goes, he goes farther than I go. Like he says, like uh, right here, he says, um, per, where's the one about the virgin? Oh, he was born of a virgin. Except this in common with what you accept about Perseus. And in what yeah, way? I... Like he's going far. I don't even know where is that. Is Perseus born of a virgin? I didn't even know that. I'd so, love to see the source, right? I know, I like I don't even know. I read. I just found this out from Justin Martyr. Like uh, Martyr. Danae, Danae, his mother had been. I believe she was a virgin until uh, she conceived Perseus by Zeus. So, right. So that's so that's, maybe he doesn't even care about that whole category of like right um oh well it was only like zeus had to have had sex with her maybe he doesn't even care to get into the detail on that he just is like look well, he was she was a virgin zeus a god had sex with her and made a a, a, a demigod you know yeah look at like bolt like click like uh healing the lame and the blind like a sleepy as we all know that but um 
I was thinking about what you just said right there because then you can then you because you can apply that to like um well first of all you could go right to the birth of Horus because how does he get born? She turns into a bird, flies over the dead body of Osiris, and then gets impregnant somehow that doing that. That's I don't know if you want to call that a virgin birth. It's a miracle birth for sure. But then you look at um Bacchus when his you know he's born twice. Mm-hmm. Sem- mm-hmm. Semele is the second birth. And in that case, it says the text literally says she was ravaged by Zeus. So that's pretty bad. Right. So that, there's a that, that's not a virgin birth. But his first birth with uh Persephone, she even after she she gives birth to Dionysus, her title is still the eternal virgin. She, so like virgin birth is it even is it about a title is that what the perseus thing is about that's what i'm wondering is she a good question you know i would recommend uh for a shameless self plug here watch my video um on the church father the church fathers and pagan parallels uh on atheologica because the the point that i make there is that it's kind of hard to argue as apologists do that Justin Martyr or any of these other church fathers are stretching or exaggerating when we find that all the things they're saying there are absolutely corroborated by the ancient sources. So um, which yeah, which every, one is it? Help me out here. So keep scrolling down. Keep scrolling down. Go down. You, go down on me. There it is right there uh, The in the up, 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 up a little church fathers. Uh, Church right. Fathers and Pagan Parallels. That one right there. Interpretatio. The, you're the Interpretatio Italian. Christian. That's all it is. Hey. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Here that's, we go. That's the one where I take on that whole. Hey, did you know? I just looked it up. Zeus. So this is this is interesting. When he when da- Dan got pregnant, it's because Zeus came turned into golden rain. That's right. So it's not a sexual unit. It's it's a miracle. He turns into mm-hmm. golden rain, and then she apparently what does it say he took the form of a golden rain to get into the bronze chamber and then seduced well he does seduce i don't know i don't know why he thinks it's a virgin birth but there's probably something there yeah like it's almost like the same birth well we we read it all the time i always pull it out augustus yeah life of caesars life of the caesars alexander Um, alexander's another one yeah deified augustus there's no um, no mortal father maybe that's what it is no mortal father equals virgin birth could be. I mean, that could be the case with that, her. That seems, says be, that seems to be the case for all of them. There's no well, it, no mortal sa- father. It says here in uh, Suetonius uh, that uh, Itai attendi- attending the sacred rites of Apollo in the middle of the night had her litter positioned in the temple and fell asleep while the other matrons were also sleeping. All of a sudden, a serpent slid up to her. This is exactly what it says. This is. It's it a, doesn't tell you anything else. It says a serpent slid up to her, then quickly went away. On waking, she purified herself as she would after sleeping with her husband. And at once there appeared on her body a mark in the image of a snake, and she was never able to get rid of it, so that ever afterwards she avoided going to public baths. Augustus was born 10 months later, and for this reason is believed to be born of the son of of Apollo. It doesn't say they had sex. It says a snake slid up to her, slid away. It tells you that. It doesn't say anything. So... Anyway, it, that's a divine birth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's yeah. what it comes down to. I think it's better just to use the term divine miracle birth than who cares if it's a virgin or not. It's about the miracle. Because that's that's the category that because because I mean, like you might say I'm, I'm, I'm choosing that category so I can have them all in the same place. But it's like, no, we're talking about divine heroes that are had this like story where all of them seem to have mortal mothers and they're sons of God. So they don't have mortal fathers. I think that's a really important thing to point out. You know what I mean? Yeah. No matter what, the it's in the category. But I do like uh, my M. David Litwa video I did where we talk about this because uh, Bart Ehrman did a course on it, talking about other virgin births. And I think he concluded that there weren't any other virgin, like the way that Christianity did. I contacted Litwa. Now, you know me. You guys know me. I'm like, yeah. hey, what's up, man? I got like speed dial on 99 scholars, right? Um, and I was like, hey, Litwa, what's up, man? Let's uh, do a do an interview. I want to talk about are there other virgin births? I'm talking about virgin births where the women 
conceive of a child not through sexual union at all because Bart Ehrman says, no, in the Greek and Roman world, they had sex with them and that was it. And he wrote me back. It's a, he said, it's really unfortunate that my teacher, Bart Ehrman, takes that position. Remember now, he was taught by Bart and several other academics. Right. And he's like, but he's just wrong. Oh, so yeah. I did a video where we like corrected Bart Ehrman on this. You and know, showed... when, you, when you invited me to do the short video for the course about virgin births, how, how excited I was. Did Bart learn about all these virgin births? Are we about to? And then I went in there and I was like, so let's talk about this virgin birth. of Right. Well, right he's right. like, well, you know, I'm more. The course is more about showing that there isn't any virgin births. It, but it does show divine births, which is. Yeah, a yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. So he does play it in the category. It's no, just it good, though. I got hyper specific and Litwa brought up Plutarch showing that the birth of Plato was a virgin birth. Literally. Oh, I forgot about that. Yes. Plutarch talks about his uh, Plato's mom being um, giving birth, uh, divine birth through uh, literally no sexual union. But uh, Derek, what what what's what's some other? Should we play something from the clip of uh, Michael Jones? You can. I was going to just throw in one other objection that uh, Nathan Nado raised in that video. You know, uh, Doctor Miller was talking about how the uh, the death of Jesus is presented more as a martyrdom in in Luke and Acts, um, but we do still have this idea of his death being an atonement for sin elsewhere, like in in Paul's letters, especially. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things Nadeau tries to say, and this is very much in line with earlier apologists like uh, uh, Ronald Nash from. Uh, many years ago in the gospel and the Greeks, when he, when they make these comparisons with other figures in the ancient world, they say that, well, none of them died for sin. None of them died for sin. And, you know, that's something that makes Jesus completely unique. <laughs> you know? Well, of course, uh, you're going to have that element in Christianity because it did partially spring from Judaism. So, mm. you know, the, the, the sacrificial cult and even the idea of um, like in uh, the suffering servant of, of Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah 53, uh, Eliezer in, uh, I want to say it's second or fourth Maccabees, uh, it's, it's his death is presented as an atonement. Naturally, you're going to have that in Christianity and not right. have that elsewhere because it is partially Jewish. We're not denying its Jewish roots completely, but we are saying it is sort of a quasi Hellenized Jewish, you know, it's, it's, it's as, it's as Greek and Hellenistic as it is Jewish. So naturally you're going to have aspects of Christianity that are more Jewish in inclination that do differentiate it from these other Greco-Roman or, or pagan uh, cults and myths and movements. Um, but at the same time, you're going to find stuff in Christianity that you don't find in Judaism precisely because it is also heavily stamped by Hellenism and, and those such ideas. I'm with you, man. We could find things that seem unique from the Jewish world. I was thinking of the Maccabees when you said, well, nobody else has ever died for the sins. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I think it's fourth Maccabees, but it might be second where I was reading and it, they die on behalf of the people. Like they right. literally become martyrs for the people. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of this, in a way they're dying for the nation. Uh, you right. see this in John, I think it says, it's like, it's better that one man die than our nation be destroyed. Um, so there is a sense in which Jesus is atoning for that. But even Paul says in an interesting way that, he talks when he's flexing on, oh, well, I've been lashed, you know, 39 times, three times or whatever. I've uh, been shipwrecked. I've been this. If they are Jews and I'm even more so if they've done this and I've even this and like he's flexing on them in that passage. Uh, he mentions that I am filling up what is lacking in Christ in terms of his 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 suffering. So Paul is filling up what. Christ was lacking in his suffering. I'll find the source for you. Um, I'm I, sure you guys. I showed my, my this birth of Alexander real quick. Yes. So when Olympias awoke from her sleep, she was amazed at the learned diviner by Snectinebo. Oh, uh, actually, I just go up a qu real quick. Uh, now nah, just keep reading. I saw the dream, the God that you told me about, and now I wish to be united with him. 
talking about Amon. Now let this be your concern. You should notify me at whatever hour he would mate with me so that I might be found most ready for the bridegroom. First of all, my lady, what you saw was a dream, but that very one who was the God in the dream is coming to unite with you. Allow me to sleep near you in the room so that you be not afraid when the God is upon you. She said, you have spoken wisely, prophet. I shall give you access to my room. And if I experience the, ma the mating and conceive, I shall greatly honor you as an infallible seer. And I shall receive you as though you were a father of the child. Necta Nebo said, the first harbinger of the God who is coming you. When you go inside and sit in your room, you will see a serpent come slithering to you. There's that one you just thought. You are to order those, those who are there to leave. Do not extinguish the light of the lamps. Go and recline on your couch and cover your face. Once again, you shall see the God whom you saw coming to you in your dreams. And immediately she gave him another room there close to her chamber, and he prepared the softest fleece of a ram together with the horns from his head, from its head, and a staff and a white robe. And he made a serpent, and he made it a soft and limp, and it slithered out of his hands. All of a sudden, he set the serpent loose, and it entered Olympias' bedroom. And when he saw, and when she saw it, she was not afraid, for she had been expecting it. And she bid those who were there to go away, each to his own place. And she reclined on the bed and covered her face. Only out of the corner of her eye did she see him assuming the appearance which she saw in the dream. And he put aside the date tree, Woodstaff, got up onto the bed and turned Olympias toward him and mated with her. Then he made his. Then he put his right hand upon her and said, Invincible and indomitable child, long may you live, my lady, for you are pregnant with a boy who shall be your avenger and become the world-conquering king of the whole civilized universe. And having said this, he took his staff and left the room. Mm. Like, what? Yeah. That's some crazy. I, and, and, and just because you had that, I mean, reading the Suetonius thing, it could be implied that the serpent did mate with her because it says that when she woke up, and this might be all in a dream, um, that when she woke up, she went and cleansed herself as the, as a, as if she slept with her husband, you know, right. so that is implied. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. So all, yeah, these are all miraculous. We're talking miraculous births here. Author Bo, thank you for that 20. Hello, guys. Just tuned in. I am a longtime viewer. Love your content. Keep doing what you're doing. Does Dr. Miller offer a audio version of his book? No, he does not. It is um, a Rutledge publication. I'm hoping at some point to get him to do a more popular audience type uh, version because it's so dense and it's such a good book uh, that he could really put this on a popular level and a lot mm -hmm. of people I think would jump on it. And then if anyone had any quarrels, it's like, no reference your academic work. If they're serious and they want to take you to task, go check out the Rutledge publication, but let's get you pub popular. Um, the closest thing you can get to his book being audibly is when he is doing his interviews on myth vision. I've done like 20 recordings and I edited them and they're on the Patreon and they're on, um, on myth vision's, uh, membership. Uh, option as well so if you became a member of either one you can access all those recordings but there's a lot we don't cover that is in his books it's just too much there's no way we can do it it's too much but i do thank you for that 20 i really appreciate the super chat um derek i i was talking to neil we found a weird thing about hercules or heracles and i wanted to kind of highlight that for a second oh, yeah so i, I mentioned up. this to to richard we didn't get to bring this up um, while he was here, but he said, notice they're willing to change narratives in these mythic tales about the figure. This is what you see with Jesus, that they're willing and capable of creating mythic, legendary folklore, you name it, with, especially when you have all these other gospels start popping up and stuff. But go ahead, Neil, what'd you right. find, brother? Yeah, so Eusebius is talking about the time of Aristobulus. So about a hundred years before in the comp BCE, hundred around that time, and it says Aristobulus and his colleagues had written in the book of records and in the epistles of the kings of the house of David and Hezekiah and Josiah and their companions were written deposited there. When they had found them and collected, they wrote in their volumes of their books and through the care of these ancient writers. When they saw that they the Jews went to the city of Tyre to praise Heracles, a hero of the Greeks, and I'm just and. The reason why I'm pointing that out is like you hear all these 
you get like you know the people we're talking about these apologist types that say like Jews no, don't do anything but outside of their religion. They're all st- they're all in this bubble, and they have no they have no interest in anything Greek at all. And it's like here you have Eusebius explaining that in this. He's citing Aristotle. I think we lost that text, by the way, Aristobulus, because I was looking for. It. I don't think it exists anymore. But he's he apparently has it, and he's talking about it. Well, I mean, I don't know why he'd make that up. So, um, and then so I then I thought something something really shocked me today when I was going through Josephus. Because I wanted to know, I, w- I was trying to find what Josephus says about this, uh, and I found something crazy. So let me just, uh, I'm going to share my screen on a c- couple things real quick, if you don't mind. Um, mm-hmm. So Josephus, it turns out that the, the translation of Josephus that most people have, which, what, is it, what, is the, what is it called again? The, the uh, Winston, I think. The Winston. That, was that due to Christian or something? I don't know. Might have been. He had to have been. because it wouldn't have shocked me. Because, um. There's in this in, in one of these books here. I got it right here. Perfect. I got it all right here. Oh, why isn't it why isn't it loading up? Let me know if you want me to play any specific spots too, Derek, from that when we get when he shows the source from that video. If yeah. there's anywhere specific you want me to. All right, one second. I don't have timestamps for any of that. Um, Mm -hmm. All right, let me just do it like this then. Let me present it like this. Can you see my screen? Mm. Uh, Yes. All right, so um, in in the translation that we have, it says he set up a temple of Hercules in the month of Peritius. But if you actually look at the Greek, this is the Greek right here. You guys can all fact check me if you want look at the greek it's there's some words in there that aren't being translated correctly and i looked them up and the word is agersis some of you might know this word it's used in plato and in the new testament see that see i'm down here mm-hmm. for waking from sleep and awakening it's literally means resurrection in the new testament look agersos awakening from sleep awakening from death and if you look at the uh times it's used it's used by Josephus in the text that I was showing. It's used in the New Testament. And what is it? What are, what are they used it for in the New Testament? Ready for this? Oh, shit. That's not the right one. They use it in Matthew. I'm going to pull this up right now. I don't think I screenshotted that one. So the 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 verse, the verse that it's in, in Ma- it's in Matthew. Um, shit. What did, why didn't I save that one? I don't know, anyways, the words the words resurrection. It's in Matthew. It, it literally translates into English as resurrection. Mm-hmm. So, so the the real the real text from Hercules. Um, and by the way, Neil Godfrey. I looked this. I, you know, who Neil Godfrey is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He found this way before me. He's he he's already on this shit because I found an article that he wrote, and he shows it right here. Uh, here it is. Neil Godfrey. So, where did it go? Josephus, he points this out. He goes, Menander, he just reads the same verse that I wrote. And then he writes right here. You did not see it in above in the Winston translation. Winston. Here is a closer look at the passage relevant by John Day. Resurrection. And it says, there's the word, ergios. The, so here's the real translation. Thus Menander as uh, refers to the, I don't know why he didn't put it in there. Anyways, the, re- the real translation is Hercules resurrected. In the month of pair of whatever it is that whatever that month is called, so they changed it to they put up a temple of Heracles in the actual Greek of Josephus. It says they put up a t- uh, they put up a temple of Jos- uh, of Heracles commemorating his resurrection in the month of blah blah blah. That's so you have it. You have a, we have Josephus talking about Heracles' resurrection being commemorated. In in Sedon entire. What do you think of that, Derek? That's pretty. And, and what did you did you mention something like an omophagia or the the actual like partaking or consumption of Heracles? Oh yeah. So Heracles and Euripides, um, they eat his flesh. I gotta find that actually. I cl- I cl- <laughs> I I x out of it. Um. Hang on, I, I don't know. I, I wanna, if you want to play some of his stuff, I can find it. 
but they find that that's what i was hoping you were going to bring yeah, up I did, because... have it. I did have it when i when i left and came back i exed out of it so but you not only have him resurrecting hercules his flesh using and the same not language only eat his flesh so that he can rise the they needed to eat his flesh it was a salvation thing it wasn't just for fun so find that source yeah, and exactly. while you do that uh i do have another super chat the place and... that stuff, i'll find it for you in, thank you for the super chat. Um, Nathan here, see comment on a theological video. In, important to emphasize, I do advocate parallels plus support the ARGS arguments. My paper had its own. Oh, it's Nathan Nadeau in the chat. Yeah, it's, it's Nathan, yeah. Okay, so, he, okay, I do advocate parallels plus support the arguments. My paper had its own argument that could be taken either way. I take it one way. Honest, thanks for... Uh, reading is that reading? You think? Thanks for reading. Yeah, it is okay. a great paper. So hold on, hold on. He commented on yours, a theological video. Okay, hold on. Yep, I didn't know that. I'm popping it up. Uh, nope, that was the wrong one. Nathan, I want to talk to you by the way. I, we, we've already talked off air. Um, but I would love to interview you and talk with you and get into this because you take a stance. I got to, I got to give you some credit, man. Um, you, you buck against NT right. And, uh, and that, that, that alone gets you some street cred. And most me. apologists on those points. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, at the end of the day, I, I'm fascinated with seeing that. Uh, let me see here. Can you guys see this? You see me scrolling? Yeah. Try to go, try going to most recent comments. Most recent, com where? How do you do that? Sort by? Yeah, sort by most recent. Okay, hold on. Let me go to this. Newest comments. Newest first. Ah, there he is. Hello. I don't disagree with many of your points, but when I talk about the historical nature of the accounts about Jesus, I'm talking about the uniqueness of the gospel text as evidence compared with the traditions of dying and rising gods. Okay, so we kind of both talked about that earlier uh, with the dying, rising God thing. Um, the point about the rise of Christianity, which I discussed in the paper and briefly mentioned elsewhere in the video, was sloppily inserted into very brief mention about the imperial cult, yet it is relevant evidence for considering Christian resurrection belief in comparison and contrast with Greek pagan resurrection beliefs. That is WRT con con conversion. The ultimate explanation will be multifaceted, of course. So um, this point right here, I'm trying to wrap my head around. Elsewhere in the video was sloppily inserted, brief mention about the imperial cult, yet it is relevant evidence for considering Christian resurrection belief in comparison and contrast with Greek pagan resurrection beliefs. Um, is this kind of going into the whole what we just mentioned about Jewish versus pagan and how there's certain Jewish motifs? Or I think he's trying to say that um, it was conversion among Christians into this new cult that makes it unique from other movements uh, in the ancient world at that time. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, I'd love to go further and see what you mean by that. Um, just curious to know. I know Paul's trying to push a monotheistic kind of, uh, you know, motif uh, on non-Jews. So, Maybe there, I mean, obviously there's going to be some differences, I would imagine. Regarding deification of human beings, it isn't something I discuss in the paper, nor am I an expert in that lit that literature. When I mention the exegesis of the Christian text, I'm referring to the arguments that Christians, the, the Christians, these texts do not represent, uh, present Jesus as an apotheosized man. Even if deification in those terms can loosely describe analog, the awareness of Jesus's status after his death and resurrection, I agree with Litwa then. And I wonder if he wouldn't agree with me were we to talk. What is behind my sense here is coming to grips with the Christian text are saying. Um, sorry, I just butchered the hell out of that. But what what did you get what he was trying to emphasize there specifically? Is this the idea that Jesus before he you know dies and, and then is considered deified, uh, that he kind of sees him? as m more than a mere man he's 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 obviously well, he says when i mention the exegesis of the christian texts i am referring to the argument that christians these texts do not uh, it, it's written kind of sloppily but 
these texts do not present Jesus as an apotheosized man, which mm -hmm. I would just vehemently disagree with him <laughs> on that. Even if deification in those terms can loosely describe analog the, the awareness of Jesus' status after his death and resurrection, I agree with Litwa then, and I wonder if he wouldn't agree with me were we to talk. What is behind my sense here is coming to grips with what Christian texts are saying. And so, um, yeah, so this this idea that him being either an apotheosized man, I know that uh, Michael Jones would probably take the approach that Jesus was not an apotheosized man. He was actually Yahweh in the flesh. And so he, he goes way beyond uh, the typical. But I'm curious to know the ins and outs of what what he is suggesting versus what, you know, you might be just saying here, Derek. I also should say that my mention of mythology was not that not what I had written down in my notes, where I conceded that on much of the definition, the Gospels do conform to the genre, but they are ultimately historical text. Generic distinctions are notoriously difficult to maintain, but still descriptively important and worthwhile. So again, we're in. So, are you suggesting their historiography? Um, because I mean, you could find. This is what Richard Miller brings out in his book and in our conversations. F find ancient fiction, and it's very hard to do this. You will find some. You might find some in Lucian. You might find some uh, in other places. But find ancient fiction that does not have realism or what we like to call verisimilitude. Historical details, people, places, things. They did this with fiction um, all the time. And in fact, that's the most common thing is to write narratives, novels, fictions, uh, you name it, with that realism there. So saying they're ultimately historical text, I'm curious to know what is historical here? Are you suggesting, well, let's forget the walking on water and the virgin birth narrative and let's forget about you know, any of the what we would consider mythic, legendary topos. Once you erase that, like we're Thomas Jefferson, then you have real history. Everything else is pretty much historical. Um, I'm curious to know on that. The explanation I am warm to is not the either demons copied God or God copied demons, as one commenter said, but that resurrection belief is an integral part of the human psyche and speaks to something about human nature, which finds its expression both in the myth, myths about it and in Jesus. This is, of course, not something I can argue historically. It is an inference presupposing a great many other things. In the paper, I do mention my own resurrection belief in the conclusion, and this is precisely why I deliberately submitted the paper to a theology journal, even while the other 49 pages are historically and linguistically focused. For what it's worth, there are all sorts of interesting evidences from the ancient world, and I do not always know what to make of them. I like this comment, and I'll say this right. because I really like this comment because— don't we all not want to die? I mean, dag nabbit, I'd love to not die. I think everybody kind of wants to not die. And I really appreciate this one because I do also think that the whole origin of the mythos and the idea of, of death and wanting to live after or, or somehow existing after, whatever mode that is, if you're, plate, if you're Platonist and you don't have a body or you're not a Platonist and you're Stoic and you think there's something, whatever. If you're a pneumatic body kind of guy and you think it's a pneumatic, the list can go on. But the fact that we still keep going after we're dead, I think that's something we all want. Even me as a, like a naturalist, I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave a legend. I want to leave a story. I want to leave, you know, a name. I want to leave memory. I want to right. leave all that. And I think we all want that. Um, so I, I don't think that you're wrong for that at all. I think that's important, uh, to investigate, but I do think that that is so commonly known in the mythic trope that it's like, you know, uh, how do we how do we bring this out of the mythic legendary trope, Derek, for example, and then now make this one true? But all, I mean, far before Jesus, Osiris, two millennia before Jesus, you already have this within an agricultural, I get it, cyclical, I get it, but that was the milieu. Just like we're finding these other figures in the milieu of Jesus's time, looking and sounding and acting similar, 
uh, what they're doing in some ways. And then sometimes it's unique. You know, you, you have them clothed in, in things we find in deities that have been the heroes of ancient times, but they, they're, they're mimicking it. They're imitating it. They have imitations. For example, the, the Ascension narrative of Jesus, very much like Romulus, very, very much like Romulus. Um, and so we start chipping away. And I mean, I've had, uh, Delcy Allison Jr. on. I really enjoy him because he really does try. And he's like, yeah, I think the closest antecedent to that is definitely Romulus. But most people want to try and only force it into the Jewish world. Well, well, you know, Elijah got taken up in a chariot or whatever. Anyway, uh, what do you have a comment on that? Or did you want me to keep going? Well, you, you know, first and foremost, uh, I, I appreciate Nathan for taking such a kind and courteous and professional tone. Um, I have noticed that uh, as of late, I've had a, a few Christian commenters surprise me by taking <laughs> kind and respectful tones. And when they do that, I absolutely uh, return the favor. You know, it's, as I said on my own social media, I live according to the brazen rule, which is do unto others as they do unto you. Uh, right. so you know what I mean? If you're respectful to me, I'm going to be respectful to you. And if you're a jerk to me, he's I'm going very to be a respectful. Jerk to you. He's very yeah. respectful. Um, yeah. so I very much appreciate that. What he's, what he's getting at here is he, he's saying that there's, and, and I agree with him that there is something to be said for the sort of collective yearning for, uh, immortality and for, you know, ongoing life beyond this one. Right. in whatever form that may take, including resurrection. But I, I, frankly, I don't think that you can, I don't think you can downplay what's going on here um, quite that easily. The, there is something to be said for what Lit was talking about and what for Dr. Miller, for what he's talking about, that with, with what we've got going on surrounding the, the resurrection of Jesus, um, here within this this Greco this Greco Roman milieu from which it emerges, you have just as you were mentioning with Romulus, all of these um, as Dr. Miller calls them protocols or signals that strongly suggest that it is playing in that kind of mythic sandbox. Right. Um, you have you know the, the the resurrection is equally part equal parts of deification. Uh, that he is, you know, he ascends to the heavens, he appears to witnesses, his body goes missing, the whole nine yards. I, I just, I can't, you can't convince it, me it's merely a coincidence that this this stuff shows up in the New Testament, you know what I mean, right there in that milieu where these kinds of motifs are popular. I think it's interesting what you just said there too. If we model, we look at two, so you've got like genre categories of what are the gospels. And a lot of them will say they're biographies. Um, there is really good reason to be skeptical of that. I downloaded a book recently that uh, is actually mentioned by Richard C. Miller in, in his book. Um, not to deny that Matthew and Luke, I hear a loud computer Sorry, noise. Um, not to deny that there isn't some, that it appears Matthew and Luke have a cradle to grave narrative for Jesus. But taking that motif of like cradle to grave, uh, you have this deified birth, right? He's like entering the world. You see this with other figures who become deified at their at their peak moment, right? They die and then they ascend and woo, now they get crowned. You see this in Philippians 2 in the hymn. You know, he was less, he was, he was still, you know, someone great, but he humbles himself, he lower, boom, he ascends. Now his name is above. You're getting crowned. They're getting that Hall of Fame tab on the chest. Here he is now. He's a deity on another level. In fact, it's no other name by which men can be saved and that all knees will bow, right? This is the guy, Jesus. Um, so uh, that sounds very, he's now deified. Post-mortem deification, this guy is being rewarded his Hall of Fame honor for for, for his death and humbling himself and such. But the gospel narratives, two of them look like biographies. Mark doesn't, according to one of the scholars that Rick Miller brings up, because there's no birth narrative. I mean, you literally jump into a scene. It's the last week or so of his life. It's not really 
It's not really doing a lot of his life here. It's just telling you a highlighted moment. The guy gets baptized, boom. And it's very narrative, like doesn't sound. So I guess you could say it's biography like, but it's not because I mean, there's no birth. It, and even if you want to call them Greco-Roman biographies, so are Suetonius's The Twelve Caesars. So is uh, you know Plutarch's Parallel Lives. And yet they still include this fanciful, fantastical stuff that we find so often in the Greco-Roman world. And we're seeing this in the Gospels as well. So I actually was able, it's actually, um, there's, it's in a bunch of, it's in a couple sources, but it's like, you're right. It's, it's tweaked in different ones. Seneca is in the first century. He's mm -hmm. a teacher of Nero and his version is this, it's the, uh, it's called the, it's called the Hercules Oita, Oetius, Oetius. And, um, so here we go. So, hold on, hold on. The governor, not that I'm not loving this. Unfortunately, I have three Siberian Huskies demanding a walk by for now. Thank you for becoming a member and that super chat. Of course, of course, the supers always got to go first. All right. Philoctetes announces the death and the last disposal of the body of Hercules. Alcamina grieves about her downfall arising out of the death of Hercules. Alcamina, in her grief, chants a funeral dirge. Hercules, having been raised to the companionship of the gods. Although I passed it. I passed it. I passed it. All right. Hercules. There's the death of Hercules. All right, so. The chorus sings of the death uh, regarding the failing strength of Hercules, that nothing born or created is lasting. A sentiment of Orpheus is, pra it is praised, and the chorus with celebrating divine art. Hercules complains about suffering undeservably, that he should be doomed and die an ignominious death, especially one arising out of a woman's treachery. Alcamina consoles Hercules while lamenting, said Hylas had returned to Hercules' That DNA after she found she found that she had deceived Nessus, killed herself. The chorus beseeches Phobus to announce to all the world the death of Hercules. They predict the apotheosis of Hercules and employ Jupiter that no more tyrants. Uh where wait, how can I, this is is this even it? Uh oh, we lost Eric for a second. Okay, so wait, this doesn't have anything about him being eaten. Sorry about that. That so that that version of it is not showing. No, it's, was, I'm not seeing anything about him being eaten here. I thought this was the one, but I guess not. Find that, and while you do that, I want to highlight. Uh, I want to highlight uh, Nathan's uh, comment. Continued. I don't follow the ongoing debate on YouTube, nor did I. Do I intend to participate in an ongoing debate between various parties? I provided a brief reflection to the interview on my blog, which, along with this comment, says pretty much all I can say at this juncture. Too many things on my plate and other focuses. However, I saw the videos of yours that discussed my paper and I defended as rational the project you were undertaking and your correct citation of my work. I have always been happy to see readers of any stripe interacting on academia as you have. Regarding any misspellings in the interview, I've never done anything like this before and it is hard to respond well in a live conversation even with notes. This is a hobby area for me something I tried to make clear at the outset of the video, even while I thought to have something important to say about it, but I have not specifically focused on it, say for a course paper I wrote a few years back, and I'm happy to keep adding to my understanding. Regards, Nathan. Nathan, let's talk, brother. I would love to chit chat and hang out with you and do a conversation. I'm not a, uh, not a debater, dude. I'm yeah. a, hang out, conversate, let's, let's deep dive together, understand each other, where we're coming from. And, um, please, I'd love that, which you were really cool. Even when I emailed you, we definitely got to talk. I think I got your number even. So maybe we could talk off record and then discuss how to go forward, um, on this discussion. But I would, I really think you went above and beyond even kind of highlighting some of the points that I think are important and are kind of ignored or downplayed by people in apologetics. And that's the game on YouTube, right? So that he brings up in like 19 minutes in, he brings up, um, you know, Herodotus bringing up the Zalmoxis cult and the resurrection motif or the idea that they would live on after death and things like that. There's a lot of stuff that uh, he brought up that I thought was interesting. All right. The gods could not take Bennett. They said, screw that guy. I'm sending him back. Did you Bennett find had him? To, no, I'm, Bennett I'm, had to pee pee. <laughs> 
Ah, I had a tinkle. Give me a second because uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, I'm looking through something right now. Okay, so he's looking for the part where the devotees or the followers of Hercules eat him after okay. he dies. Just just to highlight, like, this happens with what appears to be Bacchic kind of Dionysian. The Titans chewed the flesh and, you know, ate uh, Dionysus. And see, that goes right along with what I was saying earlier about how, you know, it's it's nice to kind of neatly categorize these things. You've got Greco-Roman apotheosis in, in this box, and then you've got the dying and rising gods in this box. And we mm -hmm. keep these nice and neat and separate. But in the ancient world, it didn't always work that way. Um, there, there were, you know, sometimes fuzzy lines, especially with all the kind of syncretism and cross-pollinization that was going on. And so here we see Heracles, uh, one of those that we would classify as Greco-Roman apotheosis, being treated like one of these agricultural gods, you yeah. know, where they're consuming his flesh like they did with Osiris or Dionysus. So that's what I'm talking about is sometimes these lines were blurred. Sure. I think you're right. I mean, you, but you're also trying to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So it's hard. Well, to there's, there's that too, because I love to sin. Oh man, you're it's silly. great. No, but <laughs> you, so good. you bring up an interesting point that we've created these kind of categories. And when we go back into it, we're trying to trying to fit it into this or fit it into that. I think that if we try to get into the mind of Justin Martyr, like, I, we can't, but if we try to imagine what we're saying about these comparisons is the case and that these are real comparisons Justin is doing in his apology. He can't deny them. They're outside in the buildings on the street corners, literally like churches today, or maybe even more. Okay. I would, I would say even more. I mean, this is a highly cultic world that they live in and it's not secularized in much the way we, we live in our world. Um, you're walking around, you see it, you can't deny it, it's there, you're engaging it and you're comparing, but you add, well, it's demons, right? Uh, what, what Nathan is saying is saying, well, I don't buy the demons, I don't buy the idea that, you know, either or position. Um, I'm going to go with the idea that people, well, what was his argument? I don't want to put words in his mouth. The explanation I am warm to is not that either demons copied God or God copied demons, as one commenter said, was that's what Justin Martyr seems to be implying, at least. And, and it gets elaborated by different fathers, as one commenter said, but that resurrection belief is an integral part of the human psyche. But but that alone, so I want to critique that. While I loved that comment, I have mm. to critique it. Right. And here's why. I agree. The, the human psyche, but that could be true whether or not you think it copied, borrowed, didn't borrow, whatever. Th the fact that it's being compared by M Justin Martyr and that we do see antecedents that seem to be utilized here, that's the problem, I would say, is, is just the human psyche isn't enough to explain what I see in the New Testament. It, it, we're hearing like bongo noises too every time you type <laughs> Derek. So like, sorry. So like, sorry. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, but you get what I'm trying to get at, right? Like I, I like I can't look at the New Testament ignoring or not really recognizing all of the other motifs that go on with different figures and such. And then just say, well, I'm going to put this one in this one box here and say, hey, all right, I don't want to compare this and I don't want to see the analogous comparison as if there's not a genealogical or even some type of connection between Christianity and the rest of these other cults. Um, I think it's just a human psyche thing. And I don't think that's necessarily what Nathan's trying to do. I just want to rule that out. I want to say that's not enough for explaining what I'm finding in the new Testament. What about you? I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, just, just as I was saying earlier, it's, it's, you can to a degree argue that, you know, because of that collective yearning for, you know, ongoing life or immortality, that naturally you're going to see this, these analogies across the board. But at the same time that we see Christianity emerging from this Greco-Roman milieu 
in which you have uh, resurrections, deifications with all these attendant motifs that line up with what we find in the New Testament, as mentioned before, deification, the missing body, appearances to witnesses, um, shining heavenly appearance, um, all these things. It's, it's, it can't just be a coincidence. I mean, if, if it is, it's a remarkable coincidence. Right, right. Something else, um, and this was written by Earl Doherty. Now, Earl Doherty is not a celebrated scholar. In fact, he's one of these mythicists that not too many people take very seriously in academic circles. Nonetheless, um, I enjoyed his work early on, and he has a great quote uh, that goes along with what we're what we're talking about that touches on this kind of perfectly he says um and that some comparative religionists need to dilute their parallelomania with a bit of analogical input almost every sect that looks back to a divine event or interaction with the deity develops a sacred meal as a commemorative thanksgiving or ritual reflection um he says if the most fundamental religious impulse is to find a way to believe in a life after death this is almost inevitably going to take the form of creating a deity who will bestow such a thing. And given our mystical predilections, it should not be surprising that a process we would all tend to hit upon is the principle of the God undergoing the desired goal himself. It would indeed take a God to conquer death. But if we could just find a way to ride through that formidable barrier on his powerful coattails. Um, these are common developments, which enjoy no exclusivity in any one expression. And yet... The reality is probably a combination of the two. He's talking about of genealogical and analogical uh, stuff going on. He mm -hmm. says, ideas are in the air precisely because they are the current product of a common impulse in the human psyche. But each expression has also absorbed the example of and been additionally motivated and influenced by other expressions. A cacophony built largely of the same oral ingredients. As in music, each generation or period of composition has its characteristic sound, one gradually evolving, not because any individual composer, and certainly not the great ones, has been consciously copying his musical peers, but because he or she cannot think musical thoughts in isolation, but will build his own expression and innovations on what is currently being heard in the environment hmm. so if you if you get what he's saying there it's it's that you shouldn't talk in in a either or dichotomy when it comes to is it analogical or is it genealogical right that is it purely psych psyche or is it purely it mythic complete right and i think i think that it's too like you point out there's way too many details to imagine that this is purely coincidental I would go a step further than it just purely being uh, cultural, like Litwell might do. I do think there's some genealogical literary reasons. I think Dennis McDonald's on the on the path of some of this stuff, though it, I'm not denying the cultural. I'm saying I just feel like it's so strong and overwhelming. I mean, look, if if the modus operandi of Luke and Matthew is to copy Mark, they're constructing narratives using an earlier narrative. I mean, is it more ad hoc or less ad hoc to assume they're also constructing, utilizing antecedents such as the LXX, such as possibly other narratives like Homer? Um, it's not out of the question. It's not ridiculous. And I think that that makes the most sense. So I'm with you. Ascension, birth narratives, post-mortem, empty tomb, you know, missing body, which is a translation fable, fable motif where someone had become a god. That's why their body goes missing. Uh, there's several, several things that I would highlight the, the eating of the flesh, drinking of their, like Osiris Dionysus, like what the heck? He is the true vine. John really paints him Dionysian. He's turning water into wine, the whole nine. Um, it just seems more than just cultural, even though I do think it's cultural. I think it's more than just psyche. I think the point is we all want to live on somehow it's where I think reincarnation and other things come to mind to try and explain it. So I just think it's special pleading for me. If you're going on record and I've said this several times, I'm saying it again, tell me if I'm wrong, Derek or, or, or nuance it a bit. If you're going on record going, but Jesus, 
No, no, no. Screw and scratch everyone else but Jesus. And ignoring uh, some of the clear statements, even of the, the Gospels that have Jesus himself condoning slavery, not seeing the, how non-moral, how backwards that would become when you have Essenes contemporaneous or even a little before this saying, I will not own another human being. That's a crime against humanity. There were Jewish Essenes who were condemning the act of owning another human. They would not do it. Yet Jesus is working in the con he's working within that moral construct because what they'll do is they'll say, yeah, but the ethical and, and there are church fathers who go, Look, the Zeus raped women. Our God did not do that, right? So they'll, they'll downplay, or Hercules murdered his family in a fit of rage, you know, that a God ended up making, go into a fit of rage, he killed his own family. No God could do that. That's ridiculous. Our God, though, like, so they were doing arguments and polemics against the pagan world, but like Jesus himself works with slavery, never condemns it. Essenes did. Why didn't Jesus, if he is able to know this, if his father is communicating with him? Like, there's so many simple things that I would highlight that make me go, you're making this one special and unique and, and, and not just laying it out there and going, look, I have faith in this one. I like the tradition. I'm a Christian by culture. But no, it, there's an apologetic grind to say, Jesus is special. This one's true. The others are wrong. And that's what Michael Jones does. So Nathan appeared on Michael Jones's channel, and whether he agrees with him, some of the water gets muddy. I'm going to shut up. Derek, tell me what you think so far. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have to say, and I, and I just have to, because I, I did finish reading the entirety of Nathan's uh, comment on my channel, um, I, I want to express how much I appreciate it. It's, it's, I know I already said this, but it's, it's, it's professional, it's kind, it's courteous, it's respectful. Right. And I, I, um, you know, uh, I, I admire him for that. And, 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 you know, I didn't go into this I didn't go into making my response video thinking that the guy was an idiot. He's not, No. he's, he's not, he's uh, that's, you know, I loved his, his paper, um, because it was so well done. And I knew, I mean, I can read, I can, <laughs> I knew he was associated with McMaster's uh, Divinity School. I did not take this to mean that he was saying uh, there were, you know, uh, risen gods in the ancient world and Jesus was one of them. <laughs> that wasn't the point. Uh, we only cited him to, because what, the, what, what apologists like Michael Jones are initially bucking is this idea that there were any bodily resurrected divinities in the ancient world, right? Like we couldn't, they, they can't, they couldn't even go that far. That's so why we you pointed citing, out that highlight in your video. That so we're he... citing, yes, yeah. Nadeau's work, that, that of John Granger Cook, who is also a Christian, who certainly believes that Jesus was raised from the dead. We're citing those works just to show that, with you know, without making any argument as to whether this has any relevance to the resurrection of Jesus, yes, th there there was such a motif in the ancient world. There there were resurrected you know heroes and divinities and and whatnot. The resurrection was a thing. That was step one, <laughs> right? Um, and how much more potent is it to be able to say, look, these are Christian scholars who are saying that. Yes, there was such a thing. It is an extra step to then argue that this has any relevance to what we find in Christianity and the New Testament. And I'm not going to depend on, you know, Nadeau or Cook to make that argument because it's not an argument they're likely to make. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so for that, you, you have to go elsewhere. And I, I definitely want to give a little praise to during the interview. I only got 30 minutes in. It's a couple hour interview. And you yeah. asked me, did you watch the whole thing? I said, not yet. That's why I was wanting to review it and go over it with you. But he brought up a Zalmoxis. He, he admits in there, says, look, N.T. Wright is wrong on this. Um, and that I got to give him major kudos and right. brownies. I appreciate anyone who comes in and doesn't sit there and have to go into the same old repeating this stuff because it becomes repetition and he he highlights that in the first 20 minutes he's pointing out like 
it's almost like there's this ax to grind position that we must have about a about a thing and he's bucking against it saying no they they had physical resurrections of of figures you wanted to play that clip of michael jones because michael jones actually went on record before saying no they did not have this and that was part of that nt right polemic that has been going on so that's the first objection that you have to overcome right (laughs) yeah because if you're going to like just if let's just pretend the supernatural is real and we're on the same page and we think you know what one of these guys could have been resurrected from the dead um we want to at least be on the same talking on the same foundation that yeah they also thought that people physically could come back or physically were alive after death in fact that's what richard c miller writes about and points out in his book i was shocked to find this out this is what rick miller said Derek, I don't know if he's mentioned this to you yet, but it really blew me away. And in his book, I'm sure you came across this, but I'll just be highlighting, preaching to the choir here. You remember the scene when Thomas touches Jesus? He says, I will not believe until I touch. He touches him. Physicality. He doubts before this. As soon as he touches him, physicality, he then exclaims, my Lord, my God. This is a direct quote, my Lord, my God, he says. Rick Miller points out, and I never thought about this. I always thought about, you know, a contradiction between Paul's letters and Luke and John on on what kind of bodies going on here. And there's still possible debate to be be had here. But the idea is, as Rick Miller points out, the only beings that could have a physical body yet appear and disappear, walk through walls, any of that kind of stuff in antiquity during this time were gods. If he could not be physical, if he was a phantom or a ghost, he was not a god. He could have been a human. He could have been a shade. He could have been so he's not a god. But if he's physical and could walk through walls, according to these, what I would call narratives, that's being without me saying fictions, because I really do think these are fictions, um, these narratives have him walking through walls. It clarifies who this person is. That's why T- Thomas tells you the answer. My Lord and my God. Like, right there. So, if we're on that basis, then we can understand why Litwa writes about saying how Zo- how um, Hercules, after he dies, hops on the pyre, goes up and ascends into Mount Olympus, and then has children. How do you have babies? Uh, how can you make physical children? How can you continue to procreate? You just burned your only physical body here on a pyre. And, and it, so it's not supposed to necessarily make sense, Lit was said. But that is told about Hercules, Heracles. He goes up and he has babies and all that. And the same can be said of Dionysus or whoever else in the Greek world that literally has a physicality to him or her after they're dead. And we can have that as a foundation derek and then move from there then we can start asking questions like why don't we actually join the cult of heracles why are we joining the cult of jesus why this one why is it this one that you think is absolutely true and you have all these analogies why is this one the one this is into the polemics and anti-polemics of apologetics but you know that's kind of the thing we're doing here on youtube and engaging and showing like you're running around telling others they're going to go to hell. And I'm not talking about Nathan here. I'm, Nathan seems very laid back and chill and wants to do this as an academic pursuit. This seems more just like a hobby in an academic pursuit, but Michael Jones is a, an apologetic channel. And he, in, along with the rest of the apologists out there are pushing the faith, polemicizing it against the world and saying, convert or, something might happen to you if you don't like what? So, so we're fighting, we're fighting a little battle here uh, in terms of uh, ideologies. That's why I did that. This is war video, Derek, but what do you think, man? What do you think? Well, I, th- I think, you know, something, something that occurred to me while you were talking about all of that too, is yeah, you know, Thomas now understands the risen Jesus as a, a God essentially, um, you know, and then what does Paul say in his letters, Romans 1, 4, that uh, he, he became the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Uh, in Philippians 2, I want to say 8 through 9, 
that's the whole idea is, is he humbles himself to death and then is highly exalted. Um, so he, he does. Yeah, I mean, this is something like an apotheosis. And he had to have been mortal beforehand, right? Or else he couldn't have been killed. Right. That's something that can only happen. So this is essentially an apotheosized man. I, I think, and I could be wrong about this because I couldn't quite make out what Nathan was saying there about the right. disagreement right. with the apotheosized man uh, thing. But if, if his point was that Jesus was in some sense already divine, well, you have that in these other myths as well. What does it say about, what does Ovid say about Asclepius? That from a god you will turn to a bloodless corpse and then to a God who was a corpse. So he was already divine, already right. something of a God, but then after his death, he's exalted to an even higher status. Romulus in Plutarch, uh, you know, when Romulus descends and he's speaking to Proculus Julius, what does he tell him? I descended from the gods. He was already divine, pre-existent in fact. That's why I was thinking the birth narratives kind of already right. tell you. Right. Uh, and notice they're all written usually after the fact. It's interesting to note that uh, you do have the Aeneid writing contemporaneous to Octavian, and he's painting him with divine attributes already. And he's alive while this is happening, which is quite interesting. But um, you, you have this kind of cradle to grave narrative, and that cradle, it's a divine birth. There's some divine birth taking place. So there is a divinity. I mean, look at Her Hercules, Heracles going through his trials and there's some miraculous things and feats he overcomes. Or you can look at other examples. I like the whole one you bring up of Asclepius, but let's use more mundane, real historical figures that we know, like the Caesars, Vespasian in the temple of Serapis, who heals a withered hand and, and spits in mud and, and, and literally rubs the eyes. Uh, you know, there are debates in the scholarly world, like, is this borrowing from this one or that one from this one? But they are using it and applying it to Vespasian, Titus. Uh, so I'm like, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. That one's not a cradle to grave narrative, but it does have him performing these feats that you would think only people who are divine or, or, or have these abilities would do. Um I'm curious to know what what all other alternative. That's why I brought up what Michael Jones would say is he thinks that Jesus is Yahweh. Like that's how far because they have a trinitarian point of view. He's kind of God in the flesh as if Yahweh and there's a trinitarian kind of theological systematic approach to explaining it because he can calm the storm. As if, you know, Jesus is the only one who calms the storm, so to speak here. But I think it's Mercury in the Aeneid and it's um, it's uh, who who was it in uh, the Odyssey or is it the Iliad? I think it's the Odyssey. Uh, it's not Mercury, but it's I can't think right now, but um, you get the point. There's other people who calm seas and stuff. Other gods. And Pedocles uh, was able to do so. And I want to say Pythagoras as well. I, oh, I just and even Augustus. <laughs> that's true because you have the quote right. by Philo, and Philo's saying like, "Hey, t what was that? Get that quote out, man. That's a freaking quote. Can uh, you grab he, that? I think I have it memorized. He he um, he uh, healed pestilences common to Greeks and barbarians. And um, nope, you know what? Maybe I don't. I have that part memorized. What what um, how? Type it in. Uh, I'm going to mute you. Type it in real quick because it makes okay, a lot type, of noise. Go ahead and mute. Me. All right, go you're mute. Me. You're mute. Oh, I just you mute, unmuted yourself. There you go. You're mute now. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, he's going to get the source. I think this is an awesome source. And and, and this is a uh, Philo right there, contemporaneous, so to speak, to Paul. And I, while he's looking for that, I just want to make the point. I don't, I think that, we would be on the same page with Michael um, inspiring philosophy and others. If you're trying to make the zeitgeisty comparison, but I think what he does often is tries to separate Jesus whole cloth from comparison. And that's where we're like, nah, we draw the line. We want to be scholarly, but we also 
aren't trying to be apologetic at all. We want to give you the facts on the ground and what seems to be the case. And I think we're on the right track. So did you get it, Derek? Oh, you're mute. Go ahead, brother. You're unmuted. Yes. Uh, this is from Philo of Alexandria. He's talking about Augustus. This is the Caesar who calmed the torrential storms on every side, who healed pestilences common to Greeks and barbarians. Uh, that is Philo in... Oh, which work is this? I'm trying to recall... L-E-G is the abbreviation, 144 to 144. Legacy, I think it's a legacy to Gaius. I think that's right. Philo. Do, 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 do. Sounds like you're playing music when you type. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, I just want to see why you do that. I'm ending the poll. Have you grabbed Dr. Richard C. Miller's book? And it says uh, 294 people voted. 58% said no. I'm planning on getting it. 33%. 8% say yes. And I don't blame people. You're talking about a $53, $54 you know, scholarly Rutledge volume. Um, but hopefully uh, they make it affordable at Rutledge. Or um, you know, Dr. Miller will rewrite another book and do it for more popular audience and go from there. So. That was Embassy to Gaius, uh, 144 to 45 from Philo of Alexandria there on Augustus. Awesome. So you just just read that part, but I thought there was a lot more to that. Like he gives him some titles and all sorts of stuff that you kind of would imagine Jesus gets. Um, I don't recall whether Philo uh, bestows such titles on him, but... Um, Augustus did bear titles like son of God and savior of the world. Uh, right. That's what I thought. About the, the, um, uh, the birth of the God who, whose, uh, gospel or good news gospel was used, uh, in association with Augustus. So clearly when, uh, early Christians are writing gospels, this is a, uh, counter movement to the imperial cult and to even Augustus. Oh, yeah. There's some good stuff. There's some good stuff. So uh, I'm going to hit Nathan up at some point here. I'll probably end up eating some lunch first before I end up doing that. But um, is there anything else that we should play? Or is there anything else you want to cover, Derek? Everybody needs to go subscribe to you, by the way. I, I think we, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we hit the main points. I mean, if there's one thing I would impress upon Nathan, it, it is that, you know, to, to make the distinction that he did, you know, to say that, that Jesus was a recent contemporaneous figure from the standpoint of the New Testament. Yes, that's fine. I would, I would agree with that. Uh, most scholars would, but, you know, having been a recent per historical person didn't prevent you from being deified um, al along the lines of these common cultural conceptions, these mythic motifs that were known uh, to earlier mythical figures. I love the way you said it earlier, Derek, is that they, they clothed themselves or others would clothe them in the, the mythos of these, of these mythical and legendary figures. I, I love that idea because what what we typically get when you get this like very, very rigorous comparison, trying to act like this person is like this person and these ancient deities that you go back, like Romulus has a, a dark past, meaning like deep, deep back, back in history. Livy tries to describe it. I know that it's in uh, Ovid too, but that's more poetic. Livy seems to be almost straightforward in his histories to try and describe what's going on with the origin of Rome, the five kind of, kings of rome and then moving into romulus as one uh with romulus and remus of course but i'm i'm sitting here reading and i'm going they did this with the caesars these are real people that are contemporaneous to the authors that are writing or at least somewhat contemporaneous some are very contemporaneous um you know virgil's writing contemporaneous to uh octavian being alive and he's building temples and he's being seen in a kind of a deity sense before he dies. There's already expectations of him becoming a god. He helped make sure Julius Caesar was deified against the Senate. Um, 
And then you have them packaged as Hercules, uh, Alexander the Great, even Julius Caesar at one point when he conquers the Gauls, th there was like this well-known, almost like singing in the streets saying like, hey, not even Alexander the Great conquered the Gauls and Julius Caesar did. So it's like they're trying to outdo them, but they're also trying to imitate them and mimic them. And they're they're wearing the clothing of them, as you heard Richard Miller talk about. So they're reaching back. They're grabbing the gods of ancient times that we probably think don't exist, but they have tales about them. And they're repackaging their lives in modeled forms after those figures. What we're suggesting is that Jesus is doing the same. There's a reaching back of, of the authors, at least, the cultic surrounding the mythology of Jesus. And they're reaching back and they're modeling uh, not only on antiquity, ancient gods of antiquity like Dionysus with John's gospel or mm -hmm. Romulus with the ascension of Jesus, but also competing with the contemporaneous stuff. As Dennis McDonald's work shows, not only are they reaching back to Homer, ancient, ancient, they're competing. Axe is competing with Virgil's Aeneid, rewriting a better, better than the Julio Claudio line, sons of God line of these Caesars. Jesus is going to have an everlasting kingdom, and it's competing with this in a way, uh, literarily. So you've got contemporaneous competition and imitation. You've got antiquity, you know, stuff going on. I, I don't know. That makes the most sense to me to act like this is all unique or this just happened and we've got to ignore the cultural milieu seems ad hoc or, or just, I don't know. It doesn't seem to make sense it's, to me. It's pretty ad hoc. And, and, you know, I think um, one of the things you have to realize and you have to acknowledge is that our explanation doesn't require anything, but what we commonly witness in yeah. The world around us their explanation requires a massive coincidence as well as phenomena that is completely um just <laughs> not not observed or known to happen uh in reality right i i echo that i agree with you and so is it odd to you, Derek? This is a personal question to you. Is it odd to you after finding all this out? You were once a Christian. I know I was extremely drinking the Kool Aid, you know, version of it. Very fundamentalist. Um, is it odd to you that humans more often are superstitious and believe in the things that are not based in reality than 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 just being rational and going based on things that we observe and and going that route? Is that odd to you thinking about it at this point? It's especially odd to me because, I mean, yes, I was a Christian, but I shed Christianity from a very young age, like adolescence. Um, it, you know, so I don't have the experience of, man, I was a church going Christian on fire for Jesus up into my adulthood. And I don't have that experience. And so it does kind of boggle my mind. I, I don't, understand how <laughs> it's uh i i, I want to be polite in how i phrase this but i just don't i don't get it i don't understand how any grown adult still um still holds to this stuff which is so obviously to me at least uh legendary i don't get it but you know to each his own i i, I my message is not to say that people can't or shouldn't um, you know, really, I'm just, um, I am making known the things I have learned over the years and defending my own non-belief and that of others. It's, it's only when someone is trying to push their agenda or their ideas or beliefs on me or others that we've got a problem. Um, so you could say that again. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what I mentioned yesterday with Dr. Cargill yeah. when we talked about his story. It is not normal to not believe in america okay it's 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 legal it's allowed um but you are ostracized there is a view uh, even in academia it's very difficult to like people like bart ehrman for example 
you could tell they also try to tiptoe. You know, they want to be professional. They want to work within the academic circles, but they can't be too polemical or they can't really speak as bold and blunt as often as you might hear us do here on YouTube. Um, it's not normal to be a non-believer. It's more normal to be of some faith community, some type of thing. And we're trying to normalize that. And so you see people out here who are still trying to, with this agenda, push Christianity, that Jesus is the truth. And you know what the repercussions are if you don't believe that, according to them. And I have people who, with their rational mind, write me messages on Facebook saying, I don't think this is true anymore. But then they write me. I got one person that writes me all the time. Hey, what is that scholar? Do they believe? Are they Christian? And I'm like, I don't know. And if I do know, I'll tell them, hey, no, they're not. Or yes, they are. Um, like some of my scholars. And they always ask, are they a Christian? What do they believe? What do they believe? And I go, why does it matter what anyone else believes? Well, they're really smart. Why would a really smart person believe that? And so they they kind of like, because they've never studied this stuff, they write me and they go, why would this really smart person believe Jesus rose from the dead if he didn't? And so I'll have like a scholar on that is a believer, and then I'll have a scholar on who's not to come and educate. And this person has tug of war go on constantly in their minds because they know, what if, what if it's true? Is it worth risking at all? That, that hell dangles over their head always. And so I feel I understand that. I know that experience. My mother conveys it to me all the time when we talk about it, which is why we don't talk about it anymore, Derek. You know my mom. I try not to bring it up. You know mom. I you know, know my mom, mom pretty mom. quite well, yeah. Um, I that's like why. We, I do too. You know, I love mom. So. <laughs> well, yeah, these are really smart people. Um, you know, it's it's – uh, it, it, you have a lot of intelligent, highly intelligent people who are believing Christians. And what you have to realize is that that stuff is compartmentalized, right? So it's it's just in this little God box where they th their beliefs just are not in accord with reality. But in their everyday lives, they are fully functional, rational human beings. And, right. and and rationality exists on a scale anyway, and and it, it, it it's you know I, I'm I'm pretty rational, pretty logical when it comes to this stuff, religion and philosophy. But in aspects of my personal life, I'm not rational at all. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm a re, I'm a recovering alcoholic for God's sake. You know what I mean? I've done plenty of being you know emotional and irrational. I'm not a robot. I'm not perfect. So we all have. We all have irrationality in different areas. We're all human. Yeah. We all have our own strengths and weaknesses. Um, so <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's its uh, different variations on the human condition. Right, right. I would love to talk with Nathan if he, I, I doubt he's watching at this point, but I would love to talk with him uh, on the record and like get him to spell out more because when when I wrote him on the email, he wrote me back. Really cool guy. In fact, I think yeah. he's a fan of what we do here at Myth Vision and educating people. Um, not to polemicize, not even yep. to like engage debate, not even to like use him against uh Michael Jones. That's not even my interest. My interest is what the facts are on the ground and how he's seeing it and just highlighting that again. I think it's amazing. He at least is willing on, even on Michael Jones to say NT rights wrong on that. If I can get him on the record to say some stuff like that, I'll be happy. I'll, I'll take any brownie points I can get in terms of getting closer to what the scholarship is. What is the most modern up to date scholarship on these arguments? And that's, I think his goal too, based on what I read in yeah. his comment to you, he's trying, he says at the end of that comment, and by the way, a comment at, I put in the comments your video, so I hope people check it out. You know, he's like at the end of it, but I have not specifically or especially focused on it, save for a course paper I wrote a few years back. I'm happy to keep adding to my understanding. Yeah. I think that's just the, you know, someone who's a student who wants to continue to learn. I'm a student, you're a student. I hope everybody stays a student. So, yeah. Yeah. I would put Nathan in a, uh, a different category. Uh, altogether from uh, most of the apologists that I uh, 
buck heads with. <laughs> right, right, right. Absolutely. Um, Derek, plug in your channel one more time, man. This is the video. If you haven't watched it, go watch it right now. Go check it out. Subscribe to Derek Bennett's YouTube channel. We lost Neil. Neil was supposed to find us the, the passage he found. Here it is in the chat. Go watch it. Should I play it right now or should we get them to go click on the dang thing? Should we tease them with the intro? Yeah, just tease them with the intro. That'll work. Just tease them a little bit. I'm gonna t I'm gonna dangle something great. Just, like you're just, little kittens, and I've got yarn for you. A little ball of yarn. Just dangle How's that it for them. Yep. I'm gonna dangle it. All right, we're gonna dangle it here. Hold on, what is this? Wrong one. Hold on. <laughs> How where'd I go? Share screen IP still not getting it on pagan parallels. Here we go. Let's see. What, what's this guy have to say? Who is this guy? Let's see. Bill <laughs> Jones of inspiring philosophy has come a long way from declaring that pagans had no belief in bodily resurrection. As N.T. Wright says, neither in Plato nor in the major alternatives just mentioned do we find any suggestion that resurrection, the return to bodily life of the dead person, was either desirable or possible. To now understanding that they did. I'm glad you clipped that. <laughs> that was that was a really good clip. Um, I also appreciate in this video that you had toned down the sarcasm just enough that it wasn't seen as derogatory to to our inner lockers, so to speak, or the people we're trying to right. communicate with. So yeah, that was cool. I'm sure that you know Nathan thought it worthy to leave a comment for that very reason. So. Yeah. Yeah. Go watch the video now. Everybody, go watch it. Okay, Derek, serious man, I'm sick and tired of you, dude. I'm so tired of you being on my screen that yeah. I've got to ask you to give us some final words here, brother. <laughs> final words? Oh, my God, the pressure. Um, hey, uh, yeah, just... Um, it, 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 I've been up since 6.45 this morning, and I'm not a morning person, so I'm about shot. Uh, uh, love one another. Um, you know what I'm saying? Um, don't know what uh, you're saying. <laughs> uh, be kind. Be nice, as Patrick Swayze said, until it's time to not be nice. And, you know, make sure you can kind of distinguish when and when not <laughs> those times are. Um, yeah. And, and don't, um, don't let people gaslight you with, with BS. Cause, uh, that, that don't fly here. And, um, mm -hmm, yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. And never forget. We are myth vision. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. <laughs>